Dragonstruck. Written by Catherine M. Hurst. Narrated using AI. Chapter 1. Heart. All manner of humans bumped past me on their way to their seats. Weary business travelers, dreamy-eyed lovers, mothers with screaming children. Who I prayed would sit far, far away from me. Don't get me wrong, it's not like I had anything against little ones. I wasn't a total jerk. However, high-pitched cries and supernatural hearing mixed as well as chalkboards and talons. The parade of humanity slowed to a trickle, and the window seat beside me remained blessedly empty. Not that I needed more legroom. An extra thousand euros had seen to that. But the last time I'd flown with the huddled masses. My roommate had recognized me. The guy had spent the entire two hours grilling me on everything, from the type of guitar I preferred, to how many groupies I'd banged. Needless to say, I loathe flying commercial airlines. At the front of the plane, a distinctly feminine energy caused me to break the cardinal rule of boarding. Never look the other passengers in the eye. Not even a stunning set of baby blues hidden behind cat's eyeglasses. The little brunette had this sexy librarian thing going on. Hair in a no-nonsense bun. A hint of makeup. And a white button down tucked into a dark skirt. I couldn't see her feet. But I bet she wore black pumps. She was cute. But not my type. I was a Grammy Award winning rock star. The woman on my arm. Like everything I wore while performing. Had to fit the brand. The brunette glanced from her ticket. To the seat numbers. And finally to me. I think I'm in the window. Keeping my head down, I mumbled, to be. Or not to be. That is the question, isn't it? She laughed at her own joke. Quoting Shakespeare. Maybe the chick was a librarian. I scowled to discourage any further communication and stood. Of course. She stared. They always did while well they puzzled out where they'd seen my face. I'd tried to blend in with a business crowd by shaving my trademark five o'clock shadow. Cutting my hair. And wearing a suit jacket over my button-down shirt and jeans. I'd even put on a pair of glasses. I called the look my Clark Kent disguise. Her carry-on bag looked as if it'd explode with the slightest provocation, but my eyes zeroed in on the bit of red lace caught in the zipper. While I congratulated myself for recognizing a kinky wolf in bookworm's clothing, she hoisted the bag mere inches from my face and shoved it into the overhead compartment. Her strength made me wonder if she was something other than human. I scented the air and my dragon sat up and took notice. She smelled like lavender and ocean breezes and home. The beast inside me purred like an oversized cat. I covered my nose and mouth with my sleeve and scowled. Oh hell no. This isn't happening. She's too young, too plain, and too human. The brunette plopped into her seat and pulled a phone from her purse. And so it begins. She'd want a selfie with me. A selfie that would end up on social media, or worse, in the tabloids. Her smile wilted. Are you okay? Wanting no part of the woman who'd caused my dragon to roll over and ask for a belly scratch, I walked to the front of the plane in search of a flight attendant. Are there any other available seats? The pretty blonde filled out her uniform in ways that I usually appreciated, but for some reason seemed blasé. In a bin there done that kind of way. Aren't you? Yes, and I don't want to cause trouble, but the woman beside me is going to be a problem. The first class cabin was full, and I'd be damned if I sat in coach. My best bet was to flirt my way into a seat reassignment. I leaned close and whispered. Any chance I can have a different seat. The flight attendant glanced at my row, sighed, met my eyes, and sighed again. We're completely full, Mr. Lawson, but I'll see what I can do. Thank you. I dropped my gaze to her name tag, lingered on her breasts, and flashed her my million-dollar grin. Layla. Her pupils dilated, and the heady scent of arousal filled my nostrils. My dragon. Who usually enjoyed the hunt. Growled. Not at her. At me. He wasn't interested in the blonde. He wanted the woman seated in my row. I turned in time to catch the librarian covertly sniffing her armpits. She must have thought I'd scowled because her deodorant had failed. Crap. This is going to be a long flight. She cast me a quivering smile, lowered her chin, and put in her earbuds. I'm an arse. My dragon roared his agreement. I hadn't meant to make her uncomfortable. Or hurt her feelings. But I'd done just that. I returned to my seat and leaned into her space. Would you like a photo? She either hadn't heard or chose to ignore me. Before I could ask again, the flight attendant approached our row. You'll have to put that away. Once again, the woman beside me didn't respond. Excuse me, miss. The flight attendant leaned across me and touched my roommate's shoulder. No electronic devices during takeoff. I pressed my head against the seat to put some distance between my face and the blonde's breasts. The librarian startled and pulled a bud from her right ear. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What did you say? Pressing even closer to me, the blonde said. No electronic devices during takeoff. 
Oh, I didn't realize. This is my third leg. I didn't have an issue on the first two flights. Her cheeks colored an adorable shade of pink. Images of her head thrown back, lips parted, eyes closed, and the same rosy color on her face flashed through my mind. This time, my body reacted, along with the dragon. What the hell? Be that as it may. This is my aircraft. My rules. The flight attendant's gaze dropped to my lap and a knowing smile curved her lips. There aren't any empty seats. I'll ask someone to switch with you after we reach our cruising altitude, or you could take my jump seat if it's too unbearable. I startled when her fingers grazed my thigh. I'd brought this on myself, but damn, I'd met junkies with more self-restraint. I'm good here. She batted her mascara-laden lashes. It's no trouble. I allowed a hint of my beast to deepen my voice. I've changed my mind. Go now. The blonde righted herself so quickly, she'd nearly toppled backward. Once she'd regained her footing, she gave me a curt nod and cast a quick glare at my roommate. Press the call button if you need anything. Fastening my seatbelt, I said. I won't, but thanks. The librarian had scrunched herself as close to the wall and as far away from me as possible. The pang of regret thrummed through me like a misstrum G chord. Though I had good reason for keeping people at arm's length, I hadn't meant to hurt her feelings. Where are you coming from? She opened her mouth to reply, but she clamped it shut when the plane picked up speed. Hands gripping the armrests, she closed her eyes and gritted her teeth. Her fear hit my nostrils, and the damned dragon struggled to reach her. The beast had behaved like a lunatic since she'd walked on board and showed no signs of stopping. I hadn't felt this out of control of my other nature since puberty. Against my better judgment, I rested my hand on her sleeve. Relax. I fly all the time for work, and I haven't crashed yet. Her eyes widened. Why would you say the C word now? I only knew one C word. One I rarely used outside the bedroom. The mere thought of the librarian on a mattress had me rock solid once again. What the heck is going on with me today? Chapter 2. Eilish. I'm going to die, and this guy's the last person I'll ever speak to. Why couldn't I have sat next to a nice old woman, or a firefighter, or a priest? I'd nearly done cartwheels down the hall when my boss had assigned me to the research team in the Outscaries. However, my joy was short-lived. In order to get from Atlanta to the Shetland Islands, I would have to fly, not one, but three flights, three takeoffs, three landings, three chances to die in a flaming ball of metal and then I'd have to survive hours on a boat in the North Sea. I would have turned down the assignment, had my roommate, Sarah, not convinced me to get a prescription for Ambien and upgrade my seats to first class. Her plan had sort of worked. I'd slept during the first leg from Atlanta to Heathrow, still drowsy. I dozed off and on from London to Glasgow. However, I hadn't taken another dose before my last flight, for fear I'd be too loopy to find my way to the harbor, or worse, fall asleep and wake up in Timbuktu. I would have managed better had the guy beside me not been a class A jerk. He'd scowled and covered his nose when I'd stowed my carry-on. Sure, I hadn't had a shower in 20 hours, but I'd used clinical strength deodorant and brushed my teeth during my last layover. His problem, not mine. I apologize. I didn't mean to jinx you. The jerk with the gray eyes removed his hand from my arm and faced forward. But we'll both live to see another day. I had two seconds to enjoy his voice before the landing gear left the ground. Certain death had come for me. I dug my fingers into the armrests. He grinned the sort of grin guys gave hysterical women. The nonverbal equivalent to mansplaining. Relax. It'll be over before you know it. Please stop talking. He made a noise that sounded too much like a laugh for my liking. My stomach dropped each time the plane accelerated or bobbled. Bile rose in my throat, and the burger I'd eaten during my layover threatened to return. I'm going to be sick. A large hand rested on my shoulder and eased me forward. Easy. Breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Nice and slow. He cooed over the roar of the engines. The engines that would fail at any second and kill us all. I had to admit, his voice was better than any prescription drug. A sense of well-being, of safety, of coming home, flooded me. The plane leveled out, and he jerked his hand back. The guy was hot, in a button-up yet casual kind of way. He looked like any other rich and successful businessman, but something about him felt off. His storm cloud gray eyes were too serious for someone who'd flirt with a flight attendant. Then again, maybe not. I'd seen plenty of women use their looks to get what they wanted. Why not a guy? He certainly had the resources to pull it off. I risked a glance in his direction. Thanks for helping to calm me down. No problem. I didn't want to wash vomit off $2,000 Italian leather boots. 
Ignoring his comment, I snatched my phone from the seat pocket, put my earbuds in and cranked the volume. Screw the flight attendant. I needed a distraction. The guy tensed as if waiting for a throat punch. Asshole wasn't a word I used often, but if the insult fit, I increased the volume to drown out the sound of the engines, and he scowled. There was no way he could hear the music, but something had crawled up his butt. I rested my head back, closed my eyes, and let the melody of my favorite song wrap around me like a warm blanket. He shifted in his seat. Are you enjoying yourself? I pretended not to hear him. He nudged my shoulder and stared until I removed one earbud. I don't think this is funny. The growl in his voice sent a shiver down my spine, a shiver I couldn't interpret. My brain warned me to tread lightly, but other parts of my anatomy responded in a very different manner. I crossed my arms to hide my hardened nipples and forced a smile. What are you talking about? He motioned to my phone. Fine, I'll turn it down. I put the bud back into my ear and adjusted the volume. The guy continued to stare. Seriously, what's his problem? Oh, come on. There's no way you can still hear it. His eyes widened for a half a second. Then he grinned and nodded. No, it's fine. Forget I said anything. Whatever thought had tumbled through his head seemed to have appeased the beast. What a whack job. Once again, I closed my eyes and focused on the music. Solstice, my favorite band, had an otherworldly sound that I loved. They'd managed to marry haunting lyrics with rock guitars and traditional Celtic instruments, like bagpipes, flutes, and mandolins, to create a unique sound. Five songs later, a different flight attendant took our dinner orders. Unlike in coach, the food in the front of the plane wasn't terrible, and it came on dishes instead of plastic containers. I often volunteered with an environmental group, fighting to bring awareness to the planet's growing garbage problem. I appreciated the real plates and silverware. The guy took a gulp of his whiskey. What were you listening to? A band called Solstice. I sincerely doubted he'd ever heard of them, but I'd play nice as long as he did. He cocked one brow and stared as if waiting for me to continue to the punchline. I glanced at his crisp button-down shirt and expensive jacket. They're probably not your style. He choked on his drink. What makes you say that? I waved in his general direction. I don't know. You look like more of a traditional music guy. He turned his body toward me. Like what? Big band and jazz. I couldn't tell if I'd offended or amused him. More like radio rock. Solstice is played on most mainstream rock stations. I do believe their latest album had four number one hits. And won a Grammy. His eyes narrowed, but a slight grin softened his expression. True. But I prefer their older stuff. They're walking the line between staying true to their roots and selling out. He sucked in a breath. I disagree. Just because a band successful doesn't mean they've sold their souls or degraded their music. I brought my hand to my mouth to prevent laughter from spilling out. I'm my leash. He opened his mouth to reply, but paused and shook his head. Nice to meet you. Is that Eilish with an E or an A? An E. My cheeks heated. Most people said my name is Eilash. Or Ellis. Not only had he gotten it right on the first try, he'd made it sound like a naughty promise. This guy is serious trouble. Chapter 3. Heart. I found myself in the most bizarre situation of my life. And that's saying a lot coming from a rock star, Dragon Shifter, who spent one month out of the year guarding an invisible magic island. As such, I did what any modern guy would do. I pulled out my phone and took to Twitter. Hive mind. On a plane discussing my music with a woman who doesn't recognize me. Hashtag clueless at 50,000 feet. The replies poured in. Some fans suggested I introduce myself, while others devised ingenious ways to mess with her head. I, of course, decided to have a little fun. So Eilish, what's your favorite Solstice song? I took a bite of my yellowtail teriyaki and smiled. I'd had better fish, but this wasn't half bad for airplane food. She tapped her finger to her lips. It's hard to choose, but I'll go with Heart's song. The title's a cheesy play on the lead singer's name, but the lyrics are beautiful. A choice. What do you think it's about? I had to hand it to her, she'd chosen one of our more obscure tracks. She knew her stuff. With the exception of my face of course. She took a large bite of her vegetarian lasagna, likely to give herself time to think. On the surface, it's about Hart's longing for home, but beneath that, he's longing for something else, something deeper, like a simpler life. I sat back in my seat. I'd written the song shortly after the band started touring. I had been homesick all right, but not for Eileen Dreyacht, the island where I was born. 
I long to turn the clock back a couple of centuries to a time when the world was smaller. I like that one, too. She nodded and continued to pick at her dinner. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. I froze. If I gave her my real name, the fun would end. Plus, I didn't enjoy embarrassing women. My friends call me Law. It's short for a name I'd rather not share. I understand about weird names. She gave me a knowing smile. You have a beautiful name. Where had that come from? The dragon. I blame the stale pickup line on the dragon. Thanks. It's common in Scotland and Ireland. Not so much in the United States. What do you do for a living? I'm a songwriter. I watched her face for signs that the pieces had fallen into place. Her eyes lit. What kind of music do you write? Anything that pays the bills. I turned my attention back to my phone and tweeted. Still no clue. Getting interesting. Discussing the meaning of my lyrics. Is this a prank? Hashtag clueless at 50,000 feet. A fan named Heart Owns My Heart replied. OMG, this is killing me, she's so lucky, I'd recognize you anywhere, hashtag, I heart heart. This, I understood. I had fans from 9 to 90, but my Twitter followers were mostly female. Crazy, besotted, females. Who professed their devotion in sweet and sometimes terrifying ways. I liked a couple dozen tweets and slipped my phone into my jacket pocket. Turning to my roommate, I said, I can't place your accent. It's part Southern, part New England, and something else. Where's home, Eilish? I grew up in Savannah, did a stint in the Navy, and attended Cornell. Now, I'm a pharmaceutical botanist at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. She pushed her glasses higher up the bridge of her nose. Gone was the woman who spoke of music like a long-lost lover, and in her place was a scientist. Impressive. I had a vague idea of what her career entailed from her title, but wanted to know more about this odd creature. What exactly does that involve? Her chin rose and a different kind of fire lit her eyes. Eilish loved her job. Basically, I study the medicinal qualities of plants. But my focus is on ancient Celtic medicine. My graduate thesis was on ancient druidic healing practices. Not much is known about the Celts because they didn't record their history in writing. But you'd be surprised what's been passed down generation to generation. If her not recognizing my face had surprised me, the new information had shocked the ever-loving shit out of me. I knew all about ancient druidic healing practices. Hell, I knew more than a few ancient druids personally. I see. The space between her brows wrinkled. Sorry, I'm not only a science nerd, I'm also a history buff. My dragon, who'd purred ever since I'd struck up the conversation, tested the confines of his cage. Namely, my flesh and bones. The beast sensed her distress and wanted to calm her. Careful to avoid touching her skin, I rested my hand on her sleeve. Never apologize for your passion. You're doing important work, curing diseases and such. Thanks, but I'm not doing anything real yet. I'm on my way to my first field research assignment. Her cheeks flushed. She dipped her chin and put the buds back into her ears. I waited until the flight attendant cleared away our dishes before I pulled my cell out and checked Twitter. Told her I'm a songwriter. How can she not know? Hashtag clueless at 50,000 feet. Eilish offered me one of her earbuds. What kind of instruments are they playing in this part? I've researched it, but can never get a straight answer. They're playing their normal instruments. The effects you hear are produced in the studio. My hand brushed hers and a jolt of electricity shot through my veins. My dragon responded by battering its way to the surface. Uncertain if I'd managed to prevent my irises from bleeding to silver, I bowed my head to avoid meeting her gaze. Eilish rubbed her fingers where I'd touched her. That was one heck of a static shock. Excuse me. I must check my emails before we land. My voice came out harsher than necessary, but I needed the conversation and the flight to end. If our first skin-to-skin -skin contact had caused me to have to wrestle my dragon into submission, I didn't dare risk another touch. I didn't have time for a girlfriend, let alone the kind of relationship my dragon wanted with a pretty human. I turned my attention to my phone. Welcome to the Twilight Zone. She had me listen to my own music. Don't want to embarrass her. 30 minutes to go. Get me off this plane. Hashtag cool as a T50,000 feet. As we made our final descent into Lerwick, I asked the flight attendant for a pen and wrote a note on a napkin. Eilish. It was a pleasure to meet you. It's not every day I come across a fan who doesn't recognize my face. If you'd like to attend a concert, send your contact information to my assistant through the band's website. I'll leave instructions with her to reserve seats for you and a guest in the VIP area. Remember what I said. Never apologize for your passion. Hart Lawson. 
Once the fastened seatbelt sign turned off, I stood and pulled her bag from the overhead compartment and set it on my seat. Thank you. It was nice meeting you, Law. Eilish glanced from her carrion to me. She opened her mouth as if to say more, but dipped her chin. You, too. I hiked my bag higher on my shoulder, pressed the note I'd written into her hand, and headed for the exit. Did you just give me your number? She called after me. I stopped in the aisle and looked back. Big mistake. Everything about her from the hint of pink on her cheeks to the curl of her lips made me want to pull her aside and have a conversation about her travel plans. My dragon roared his agreement. All the more reason to run. Goodbye, Eilish. Chapter 4. Eilish. I'd earned my doctorate from Cornell University, but there were days when I had absolutely no common sense. Today was one of those days. Sitting in a bathroom stall, the one place in an airport that provided a modicum of privacy, I read the note for the fifth time. Hart Lawson. How had I sat beside Hart, freaking, Lawson, for over two hours and hadn't recognized him? I needed chocolate, and a warm blanket, and my best friend. Shoving the letter in my bag, I dialed Sarah. Hey, did you make it to Bury? The sound of her voice took the edge off my nerves. Just landed, still have a ferry and a taxi to go. You're not going to believe what just happened. I relate every awkward moment of my time with Hart. She gasped. You're serious. How is it even possible? You've made a part-time job of staring at the man's pictures. I'd asked myself the same question repeatedly. He looked different. Clean-shaven. Haircut. Superman glasses. He pulled a Clark Ken. What? The woman in the next stall cleared her throat. You know. Superman's glasses wearing alter ego Clark Kent. Sarah laughed. Why are you on the phone? You should go after him. He's long gone. Besides, he didn't offer to meet me or anything. Just free concert tickets. I emerged from the stall and faced a line of women waiting to use the bathroom, offering an apologetic smile. I washed my hands and hurried out of the ladies' room. So what's he like? Honestly, he was confusing. At first, he was a complete ass, but then he seemed to warm up. It's probably my fault. I mean, how awkward must it have been for him? I made him listen to a song he wrote about himself. Sarah giggled. Only you, darling, only you. I glanced at the clock and frowned. Crap. I'm going to miss the ferry. I'll call from my room tonight. Promise me you'll get a selfie when you see him again. I most definitely will not see Hart Lawson again. Lightning doesn't strike twice. Uh-huh. Call me later. Sarah laughed and disconnected. I seriously doubted I'd run into Hart. But if I did, I wouldn't screw it up. Again. Lightning struck again on the ferry to Brewery. Hart Lawson sat a few tables away. Mortified, I scrunched down in my seat. Of all the places in the world he could travel, why on earth would he visit the Outscaries? And what were the chances of us winding up on the same boat? My researcher's brain kicked in. I remembered reading he'd grown up on a small island off the coast of Scotland, but the article hadn't mentioned the name of the village. In fact, the author had noted that Hart had specifically kept certain details to himself to protect his family's privacy. Not that I could blame him. No one wanted the paparazzi taking pictures of their grandmother on her morning walk. No bloody way. His voice echoed through the nearly empty ferry. I glanced up, expecting him to be on the phone, and found him scowling. At me. This can't be happening. His long legs ate up the distance between us. Let me guess, you just happen to be heading toward Bruray? I am. I have the address of the room I'm renting if you'd like to see proof. I booked it three weeks ago. What the heck? He'd written me a sweet note, offered concert tickets, and now this. It occurred to me that a man like him had to be careful. He probably had photographers, the press, and fans who didn't know the difference between devotion and stalking. I'm not following you. Uh-huh. He narrowed his eyes. Who are you really? I'm Eilish Blair, a pharmaceutical botanist who works for the CDC in Atlanta. Hang on, I'll show you. I fished around in my bag for my documents. Papers can be forged. He ran both his hands over his head. You've changed your appearance. What happened to your glasses? I had no intention of telling this alpha hole that I wore them as a deterrent against guys like him, who wouldn't bother flirting with an intelligent woman. Where are yours? I wear them when I don't want to be recognized by people like you. My mouth fell open. I'm not a photographer stalker. I didn't even know who you were. Hart leaned close enough to whisper. Look, I don't care who you are. Stay away from me. 
The venom in his voice and the odd flash of silver in his eyes made my pulse race. I'd grown up in an affluent suburb of Savannah and spent my first four years after high school in the Navy. I'd pulled drowning people out of the ocean, but I'd never once felt unsafe. Until then, he gave me one last dirty look and stalked to the front of the ferry. After the shock wore off and I remembered to breathe, the trembling began. It started in my hands and before long it spread through my entire body. Fireflies danced in my peripheral vision, and I felt as if I might vomit. I stood and made my way to the aft exit. Once outside, I gripped the railing and closed my eyes. The thick air coated my face with salt and moisture, but I didn't care. I needed a few moments with nature to calm my racing heart and clear my head. Unfortunately, my alone time ended far too quickly. I felt Hart's presence before I laid eyes on him. A heavy feeling settled over me like the sensation I had before speaking in front of a large crowd. I risked a glance around the edge of the wall and found him standing at the railing on the opposite side of the vessel. He had his head thrown back and his eyes closed. Shoot. I ducked back before he spotted me. The absolute last thing I wanted was for him to think I'd followed him onto the deck. I had two choices. Stay in my hiding place like a coward, or go back inside and risk being spotted. Determined to return to my seat, I rounded the corner and stopped dead. Hart Lawson stood on the railing flailing his arms, then as if in slow motion, he went overboard. Years of water rescue training kicked in. I pulled the alarm, grabbed a life preserver, and threw it toward him in the water. Chapter 5 Hart Ohm called to me, but I leash called to my dragon, or he called to her. I hadn't quite worked out the details, but I knew it meant trouble. I doubted she was a real threat, and I certainly doubted she was a hunter. I would have smelled the lie when I'd confronted her, though, she could be one of their spies. The ancient enemies of the druids were capable of most anything. Including using a sexy librarian to lead them to Eileen Dreicht. The only thing I knew for certain was I needed to put distance between myself and Eilish, even if that meant threatening her. My dragon may have wanted to claim her, but I'd be damned if I saddled myself with a woman ever again. The hunters had murdered my mate centuries ago, but I still felt her absence every day. Even if I wanted to settle down, Eilish was human. She'd die long before I did. I'd barely survived becoming a widower the first time around, I had absolutely no desire to put myself through it again. I climbed onto the railing to jump, and my damnable beast lurched toward the surface. As much as I wanted to go over, he wanted to stay on the boat with her. The dragon and I were one in the same, two natures of a singular being with two distinct forms. However, at that moment, my two halves warred. Teetering on the slippery metal, we struggled for dominance. No way in hell would I let the dragon out now. Its weight alone would sink the ferry. I had to get to the island before I lost control and exposed myself to the humans. A deed that would risk the safety of my people, earn me years of lockdown on Eileen Dreicht, and end my music career. That thought alone gave me the strength to push forward. Arms and legs flailing, I fell and hit the water gut first. The air evacuated from my lungs, and a basic instinct to survive had me breathing in icy salt water. My dragon and my blood roaring through my skull, I fought to gain my bearings in the churning sea. I called my other nature forward, but nothing happened. No tingling of magic, no hardening of skin, no explosion of bone and muscle. My lungs seized, heart stuttered, and muscles cramped from the freezing temperatures and lack of oxygen. Shifter or not, if I didn't reach air soon, I'd drown or succumb to hypothermia. Wardens of Eileen Dryak died in battle, not from a chest full of cold water. I swam toward what I hoped was the surface and called the dragon again. Nothing. Son of a bitch. Using the last of my strength I kicked harder until I broke the surface. As much as the lack of oxygen had hurt, the sudden intake of breath felt as if hundreds of barbs pierced my lungs. I rose and fell in the turbulent water, and the occasional whitecap slapped my face like a scorned lover. Something heavy landed several feet away, and a spotlight cut through the heavy fog. The ferry had stopped. A shimmer of light to my left caught my attention. A life preserver. Someone had thrown a life preserver. I had to shift and get out of there before they pulled me back onto the boat. My people counted on me and others from my clan to serve during the lunar cycle of our zodiac sign, the time when I was at my strongest. A delay, even a day, could give the hunters an opportunity to strike. I turned my attention inward to my magic. The magic from the island of Eileen Dryak sang to me like a mother's lullaby. I was close. Had it not been the middle of the night, I would have spotted the cliffs jutting into the sky. 
I'd never attempted to swim the distance in human form and didn't know if I'd make it. If I survived the sea, the rocks along the shore would likely end me. Heart. The voice called out. No, it couldn't be a voice. Not even my preternatural hearing could have made out a voice from the ferry over the swirling water. It had to be a gull. My dragon, the bastard, disagreed. Whatever had made the noise spurred the beast on. He surged to the surface and fought to break free. This time I let him. In the process of changing forms, the life preserver had lodged in one of my front talons. I tugged the damn thing to snap the rope securing it to the ferry. The tether held. I jerked it again, harder. In the distance, someone screamed, and it wasn't a gull. I turned in time to witness Eilish go into the water. She tried to save my life by throwing the life preserver. The rope must have tangled around her somehow. Had I killed her? My chest tightened and my throat swelled with emotion. I may have wanted nothing to do with her, but she tried to save my life, and it had cost hers. Mine. My beast had never spoken in words. He purred, he hissed, he pushed against my flesh and bones. But never had he uttered a word. He planned to claim her. She can never be ours. The dragon roared and cut through the water as fast as any sea creature. The beast had made up his mind. She belonged to us. Nothing would stop him from saving the woman he'd chosen for his mate, but I had to try. I needed to regain control before someone on board spotted me. The logical part of my mind knew Eilish was lost. She'd likely died from cold shock upon impact with the water. If not, she had minutes before she lost dexterity in her arms and legs and sank. She's not going to make it. I felt like a fool. Only children trying to understand their dual natures spoke to their dragons. Mine. The reply came through loud and clear. I didn't have time to argue with my other half. There'd be time enough for that once I'd found Eilish. Using the dragon's physical strength, I dove under and swim beneath her. She was alive, but judging by the slow movement of her legs, hypothermia had begun to take her. I had to act fast. Moving toward the surface, I grabbed her with my back talons and shot from the water. One of the spotlights from the ferry skimmed over my tail but didn't stop. Thank love for small miracles, but now, I needed a big one. Once I reached a fog hanging over the water, I shifted Eilish to my front paws and cradled her to my chest. Dragons ran hot, but I had no way of knowing if my body heat would be enough. I had to get her to dry land and in front of a fire. Eileen Dryak was the closest shore, but our laws forbade humans from setting foot on the island. Once she crossed the magical barrier that protected my people from the outside world, the druids would decide her fate. Even if they spared her life, they'd likely forbid her from ever returning to the human world. A chance at life is better than certain death. Eilish stirred, and my heart stilled. I didn't know her well, but I doubted she'd react calmly to a dragon, roughly the size of a city bus, carrying her through the sky. She muttered something about dreaming and cold and passed out again. The beast made a keening sound that echoed the growing fear in my heart. I held my breath in my lungs until they burned for want of oxygen, then curled my head and exhaled the heated air over her tiny form. Eilish huddled closer to my chest, which pleased my dragon immensely. The hum of magic surrounding the island grew louder. I'd done it. I'd saved the life of the woman who tried to save mine. A few more yards, and we'd enter the more tempered climate of Eileen Dryat. I'd plead a case to the druids. They'd take the word of a warden. The human female was no threat to the inhabitants of the island. In fact, her knowledge of plants and medicines could be an asset. We're almost home, Eilish. You like it here. I cooed to her though she couldn't hear Dragon speak. I heard the shot a half heartbeat before pain lanced through my right wing. I faltered and veered to the side. The barbs of a harpoon ripped my flesh, but I knew they'd hold. I'd been so preoccupied with Eilish that I'd failed to notice the hunters in the boat below. But they damn sure noticed me. Hunters here. So close. How? To my knowledge, they didn't know the location of the island. To make matters worse, my wing began to tingle, a distinct tingle that I'd encountered twice in my life. Death weed poison. Harpoons were the least of my problems. If I didn't flush the wound and get the antidote fast, I wouldn't live to see the sunrise. I had two choices. Keep flying and risk them reeling me in like a flying fish, or shift and risk Eilish and myself in a fall. I decided to do both. Using the trajectory of my body to gain ground, I dove at an angle toward the sea. With any luck, I'd cross the barrier and shift a few feet above the water. Turns out, I didn't need to worry about the poison. We hit the sea too hard, too fast, and too close to the rocks to survive. 
Chapter 6. Eilish. Hypnic jerks. The sense of falling while sleeping, followed by involuntary muscle movement. Most people experience them even if they didn't know the technical term. This, however, was no dream. I woke plummeting from the sky and wrapped in the claws of a monster. Before I could draw the breath to scream, the creature holding me vanished. Hart Lawson, lead singer of my favorite band, and my least favorite person on the planet, crushed me to his chest. We hit the water with the force of a rocket breaking the sound barrier. The shock of the collision had me gasping for air. Seawater filled my nose and mouth and settled in the bottom of my lungs. My survival instincts had me swimming for the surface, but the weight of my clothing weighed me down. Heart ripped the heavy wool from my shoulders and tugged me in the same direction as the bubbles. I managed a quick gulp of air before a wave crested overhead. The force of the water tore me from his grip and sent me tumbling. Without sunlight, navigating up and down became impossible in the churning water. I curled into a defensive posture to protect my head and let the wave take me. When the movement slowed, I kicked for the surface again. The sea roared from all directions as my body lifted and fell at the whims of the surge. My military instructors had taught me to follow the direction of the waves to reach the shore, but these had no discernible pattern. Not to mention, I wasn't alone. Heart, I called out to him several times without receiving a reply. I rose on another wave, only this time it crested over my head and propelled me forward. When the violence of the movement stopped, a familiar peace settled over me. A sense of serenity replaced the sounds and pain and fear. I could stay here stop fighting and give myself over to the sea and drift off into the darkness. The words of my former air sea rescue instructor echoed in my head. The first step to survival is deciding to live. I wanted to live. I would survive. Kicking with the last of my strength, I followed the bubbles to the surface. A strong set of arms wrapped around me. I struggled against them at first, but a different sort of peace washed over me. A sense of home and belonging in the future. Heart. We breached the water together. Gasping for precious air, he tightened his grip and nodded behind me. Swim that way. Safer. Before I could respond, a crested wave hit us at an angle. The force sent us careening into the rocks. Hart's upper body and head took the brunt of the impact. He grunted once, went limp, and sank below the surface. Pulling him up by his hair, I slid my free arm diagonally across his chest and hooked my hand beneath his armpit. Anyone who'd ever worked in water rescue understood the dangers of a drowning victim dragging the first responder down with them. In this case, my primary objective became keeping both our heads above the surf. I turned to my side and braced him against my hip. Using my free arm, I swam at an angle toward the shore. Something large brushed against my legs, and I stilled. While most dangerous sharks preferred warmer waters, I couldn't be sure what swam with us. It occurred to me that the water was warm, much too warm for December in the North Sea. That's impossible. I must have passed the point of feeling the cold. Still, I've spent too much time in the water to still have control of my limbs. Before I could puzzle out the anomaly, the fish rammed into me with enough force to toss me and hard into the air. I sucked in a breath and held it. We came down hard. Water shot up my nose and forced me to release my breath, but I managed to hold onto him. Bracing myself for the inevitable jaws closing around my legs, I tightened my grip on heart. If this thing wanted a meal, he'd have to fight me for it. Granted, I couldn't put up much resistance, but I'd try. The second time the creature lifted us, I grabbed a hold of its spiky fin, in hopes of avoiding its mouth. To my surprise, it didn't dive deeper. The animal moved its enormous eel-like body past the breakers, gave a little shake to loosen my grip, and headed for deeper waters. Holding heart, I kicked as if to swim, but my feet brushed against the ocean floor. Whatever the heck that thing was, it had saved our lives. Nothing made sense. I remembered going over the railing on the ferry. While out, I'd hallucinated or dreamed of a dragon. The water had been cold, so cold my limbs had gone numb. But here it was much warmer. And what kind of sea animal helped humans to shore? Dolphins. I'd heard stories of helpful dolphins, but that thing was the size of an orca, or had I imagined it? Out of the water, the naked man weighed a metric ton. I held him in a fireman's carry and trudged across the rocky shore. Every two or three steps, my feet slid on the smooth rocks and brought me to my knees. 
I'd lost both my shoes in the water. Not that sensible pumps were all that sensible on slippery stones. Exhausted, I managed to reach a sandy area behind a boulder. The large rock provided some protection from the wind and ocean spray, but no warmth. Once again, I found the climate strange. The Shetland Islands shared a latitude with Norway and the southern tip of Greenland. I'd never traveled outside of the United States, yet the beach seemed familiar. The moon gave enough light for me to see the striations in the rock. It wasn't a boulder at all, nor was the sarsen stone native to this part of the British Isles. In fact, the monolith was made of the same silicified sandstone ancient people had used to create formations like Stonehenge. Heart, can you hear me? I pressed my fingers to his neck and detected a strong pulse. He didn't stir. No surprise, he'd cracked his head against the rock hard enough to be heard over the waves. I prayed he'd wake with nothing more than a headache, but that would take a miracle. He needs medical care, but where were we? I stood and scanned the deserted beach for lights in the distance. The emptiness of the land sent a shiver down my spine. Coastal areas in the United States were prime real estate. It was unusual to find a stretch of waterfront property without a house or hotel. This place had nothing, nothing but cliffs. Cliffs. I bet the town is above us. The thought gave me a ray of hope, but I had a problem. Without a light source, I couldn't see well enough to climb a footpath. We were stuck on the shore until morning. Hart muttered in his sleep. It's all right, we're safe. I knelt beside him and brushed his hair from his face. The same jolt of static I'd felt on the plane arced between us. Odd, all things considered. Now that my adrenaline had worn off, I felt every scratch and scrape. My muscles ached and my head pounded, likely from swallowing too much salt water. The mere thought had me holding my midsection. Hard and I would need fresh water soon, or we'd suffer from dehydration. I shook my head before my mind went too far into things that could kill us land. We're going to survive this. Hart opened his eyes and moved his hand as if he'd attempted to lift it. Eilish, come. I laced my fingers with his. Stay still. You have a head injury and a fever. I'll find help after the sun rises, but we're safe for now. Poison. Shoulder. He continued to mumble in Gaelic, and his face went slack again. I eased him to his side and the odor of necrotic flesh filled my nose and clung to the back of my throat. Sam coated a wound the size of a man's fist at the base of his shoulder blade. Flashes of memories filled my mind. Plants with purple berries, yellow blossoms, and an earthen mug. The images made no sense. I scrambled to stand, but my vision warbled until I had to sit back down. A female voice ordered me to sleep, but we were alone on the beach. She commanded me to sleep again, and I realized the voice had come from inside my head. Part of me wanted to resist the command from God, or my subconscious, or wherever it had come from, but my body refused to cooperate. I curled against hard and drifted off. Chapter 7. Heart. Every jostle, every bump, every bloody movement felt as if someone speared my skull. My mouth tasted as if a selkie had taken a crap in it. My shoulder ached, and my skin itched beneath a layer of dried salt water. I had no idea how I'd made it to shore, nor did I understand why I hadn't healed. But I had to put an end to the incessant movement before my head split open from the pressure. Stop. My throat ached from disuse. A female replied. I can't. We're almost to the top. Shove on. I attempted to lift my head, but something held it in place. My eyelids, however, were free to open at will. Holy shit. Are you crazy? Release me. The litter, or whatever the hell the fox shifter had tied me to, rested at nearly a 90 degree angle over an incline. The cliffs. She'd strapped me down naked and proceeded to haul me to the top of the cliffs. Of course, I could break free of whatever she'd used to shackle me, but not without risking sending both of us over the edge. Be still. You're heavy enough without all that wiggling. She laughed. Release me. I need to shift and heal. Shift. Another female voice filled my ears and woke my dragon. Eilish. She survived. Shut your gob, human. Shavon spat the last word out like a curse. I closed my eyes and inhaled Eilish's scent lingering on my skin, and pieces of memories of the previous evening came back to me. The human you're speaking to saved my life. Shavon laughed. No, you don't. McGregor saved your bloody hide after you knocked your hard head on the rocks. He would have eaten the scrawny human had she not clung to you like a barnacle. 
Someone else must have found you and fixed up your shoulder. You smell like deathweed poison. I vaguely remembered the tingling in my wing before we'd hit the water. Who? You're asking me. Chevon laughed. I didn't see anyone else on the beach. Eilish said. It doesn't matter now. Are you injured? I had to ask, though I assumed my dragon would have reacted by now if the human were in distress. Dehydrated and confused, but I'm okay. She sounded winded but strong. She'll live long enough for the druids to decide what to do with her. Chevon grunted and hauled the litter onto flat ground. A rustling sound, followed by falling rocks, and a cry from Eilish had my dragon dangerously close to the surface. He worried over the human, and I worried over my pounding head. I desperately needed to change forms and heal before facing the druids. Oh, for the love of Brigitte. Chevon moved past me. A moment later, Eilish landed beside the litter with a thud. I'd had enough. After the hell of the previous 24 or so hours, I was in no mood to deal with the cranky fox shifter. Drawing a sliver of magic to the surface, I snapped the straps of leather tethering me to the litter. Your eyes! Eilish's hands flew to her mouth, but her gaze remained fixed on my metallic silver irises. Chevon nudged my good shoulder. You may as well change and get it over with. She's a slow one, but she'll figure it all out soon enough. What's she talking about? Eilish glanced from the fox shifter to me. Only she didn't stop at my face. She studied my bare body like a reference catalog until color bloomed on her cheeks. I'd felt her gaze move down my chest as if it were a tangible thing, and my body responded. Turning my back to the females to hide my erection, I spoke to Chevon. You brought a litter, but it never occurred to you to bring clothing. And spoil the view? She set her hand on my shoulder and lowered her voice. You know how much I love. I've missed you, heart. The young female knew better than to tempt a warden so close to their lunar month. Clan Birch would come into our power at midnight. Wardens gained not only physical strength during their cycle, but also fertility. My dragon growled, and so did Eilish. Chevon narrowed her eyes at the human and turned back to me. McGregor was watching the hunter's boat and saw the attack. You're weakened because of the poison on the harpoon. Since when do they have access to death weed extract? Let alone, know to put it on their weapons. A chill shot down my spine. Considering the plant only grew on Eileen Dryacht, it meant one of my own people had given it to them. That's news to me, but last night. It's looking like they knew where to be finding you. I leaned closer and whispered what I hoped was the truth, Eilish isn't a hunter. Chevon shrugged one shoulder and ran her fingertips down my chest. Before I could get my primal side under control, my dragon roared and snapped his teeth at the fox. The female dropped to her knees and canted her head to the side to expose her neck. My beast might have appreciated the act of submission, but I didn't buy it. Young or not, Chevon had made her feelings for me known years ago. The girl claimed to be in love with me, but I suspected she saw me as her ticket into the human world. I motioned to her. Go. I'll escort Eilish to the grove. The damnable female shifted into a fox, shook her bushy tail, and scampered off. Wide-eyed, Eilish stared after her. She just did you where are we? Am I dreaming? Barely wishing I had clothing to cover myself, I took her by the shoulders and waited until she met my eyes. We are on an island in the North Sea called Eileen Dryacht. You won't find it on a map. It's hidden from the mortal world. The inhabitants here aren't human, even if they appear so. She nodded, but I doubted she'd understood a word I'd said. Her cheeks had lost their color, and a layer of sweat broke out across her brow. I'm delirious from dehydration. I gave her a firm shake. Eilish, you must listen to me. I'm telling you the truth. This island is sacred to my people. Most humans are forbidden here. I must present you to the druids and plead your case. She blinked and met my gaze. Something I'd said had gotten through to her. That fox woman. She seemed to think they'd kill me. I wanted to drop her at the druid's feet and forget I'd ever laid eyes on her, but my dragon had other ideas. A need to comfort her, to tell her everything would be alright, to claim her, rose up in me. The words fell out of my mouth before I could stop them. I'll do everything in my power to protect you. Eilish stared as if I'd spoken in another language. The mild rejection helped to clear my mind. Tell me the truth. Are you a hunter? She furred her brow. My dad used to hunt, but I've only ever shot beer cans or targets. I hung my head and spoke to my beast. This is exactly why we can't have her. She will never understand our world. He purred his response. I understood, I did. Part of me wanted her, unfortunately, it wasn't only the scaly fire-breathing part. Heart. I shook my head. I'm not talking about men in camouflage, shooting deer for sport. I'm referring to those who seek to eliminate otherworldly creatures and magic. No. Up until. 
She motioned to the area where Chevon had shifted. I didn't know such things were possible. They are possible, right? I looked to the sky for guidance and found none. Explaining my world felt like playing Mozart without sheet music. Yes. This is all real. I don't have time to explain. I must take you to the sacred grove. Eilish turned away. It was you. You're the dragon. Yes. I held my breath and waited for her reaction. I'd known her mere hours, yet for some ungodly reason, her opinion mattered more to me than I cared to consider. I needed to put distance between us. The sooner I took her to the druids, the sooner I could get my life back on track. Show me. She folded her arms and raised her chin. As much as I needed to shift to heal, I dared not reveal myself. Not yet. Not until she faced the druids. I may not want to mate her, but that didn't mean I wanted harm to come to her. She'd have a better chance of survival if she remained calm, and seeing a dragon for the first time didn't exactly inspire tranquility. We don't have time. I took her arm and pulled her in the direction of the sacred grove. The stubborn woman jerked free. I'm not going anywhere until you show me. I turned, grabbed her upper thighs, and hoisted her over my shoulder. I'll show you plenty, once the druids decide if you are to live or die. Chapter 8. Eilish. Women who turned into foxes, rock stars who shifted into dragons, and druids let's not forget about the druids. My subconscious had outdone itself this time. I told myself I was having one hell of a nightmare. A nightmare that had turned into something entirely different. When Hart Lawson slung me over his shoulder, who wouldn't stare at his perfectly sculpted and very bare, but as much as I tried to convince myself I dreamed up the entire situation, the little voice in the back of my head screamed. It wasn't me. No. There was a perfectly logical scientific explanation for everything I'd seen. There had to be. I'd lost track of how long the man carried me, but I thought minutes had passed not hours. Yet, the scenery had changed from the grasslands above the cliffs to a deciduous forest. The plant life I could identify from my vantage point should not have flourished in salty air. Hart's shoulders tensed beneath my belly. He hesitated then set me on my feet and knelt. I stood dumbstruck. It wasn't every day a naked rock star dropped to one knee in front of me. Show sure respect. He nodded behind me. I turned and came face to face with the most beautiful creature I'd ever seen. The woman wore a moss green cloak with the hood down. A rite of auburn curls hung to the backs of her knees, in a variety of braids each adorned with shells, metal trinkets, and jewels. Her pale skin gave her another worldly glow, but her eyes shifted in kaleidoscopes of color ranging from green to blue to pink to deep lavender. She smiled, and the air around her crackled and hummed. This woman was not a woman at all, or not human anyway. One word came to my mind. Druidus. I dropped to my knees, but couldn't bring myself to avert my eyes. She seemed so familiar, like the princesses I'd conjured up in my childhood fantasies. Warden of Clan Birch. Rise. The female's voice reminded me of wind chimes and rustling leaves. Hart stood and rested his hand on my shoulder. I have come to speak for. We know why you have come. Her voice held a hint of humor. We conversed about the matter of the human. Has a decision been reached? Hart's grip tightened, though I couldn't understand why. Sure, ancient druids were rumored to have sacrificed humans to their gods, but she sounded friendly enough. I would have expected a harsher tone of voice if she planned to have me beheaded and use my skull as a coffee mug. I risked a glance at him and wished I hadn't. He stood taut as if anticipating the crack of a whip. We understand this woman came to be here because she attempted to save your life. That's correct, and once we crossed the barrier, she showed strength and bravery in preventing my drowning. The female stepped forward. You may rise, human. Keeping my gaze low, I stood. I'd seen movies where commoners were brought before royalty, but I doubted I could pull off a curtsy with my quaking knees. We have decided to observe you for one lunar cycle. If you prove yourself worthy, you will be welcome to remain. She tilted her head and studied my face. If we find you are a hunter, your time will end long before the moon waxes. I understood the situation enough to recognize the threat. Not trusting my voice, I nodded. The female turned to Hart. Warden, you are responsible for her supervision until the moon phases out of Birch. You will provide food and shelter for her until we reach our final decision. Your other duties are secondary until the human is settled. I winced. Supervision. 
Exactly what do these people think I'm going to do? Call in a military strike, kill their chickens and steal their babies. His expression hardened. I was attacked last night, just beyond the barrier on the eastern coast. Are you certain I'm not needed? The druidess pressed her lips into a thin line. She either disapproved of his news or his questioning her decisions, perhaps both. Be that as it may, your priority is the human. There are others who can defend Eileen Dryopt from our enemies. Do you need healing? No. It seems a good Samaritan took care of the death weed poison while I slept. Her eyes widened a fraction of an inch. I would have missed it had I not been staring at her lovely face. The druidess said. So it has come to pass. We have a traitor in our midst. His grip on my shoulder tightened. It appears so. I will inform the others. She glanced at me and smiled, but spoke to heart. We shall find your savior and thank them properly. Until then, you are to remain with the human woman. Hart released me and bowed, though his movements were stiffer than before. Thank you for your mercy. The druidess canted her head turned and vanished into the forest. My lungs squeezed shut, and my heart raced. The tree canopy seemed to lower, pressing tighter. I want to go home. I'm afraid that's impossible. He reached for me, but seemed to think the better of it. I put my hands on my thighs and bent at the waist, forcing myself to breathe in through my nose and out through my mouth. I tried to stave off the panic attack, but it was no use. I couldn't stop shaking any more than I could blink away the fireflies in my peripheral vision. As he'd done on the plane, Hard eased my shoulders forward. Breathe. Slow. In for three, out for three. You're safe. On an island full of creatures, I focused on a memory of my parents at Thanksgiving. Dead or alive, I'd never see them again. My family, my friends, my job, all of it was lost to me. The druidess hadn't shown mercy at all. Hart pulled me into an embrace. Eilish, listen to me. No harm will come to you here. You're under my protection. Part of me wanted to settle into his arms, but I wasn't the type of woman who did well under supervision. My parents had grounded me for a week once, and I'd nearly lost my mind. I thrived on working. The idea of being locked in Hart's house made me twitchy. Did he even have an actual house? Didn't dragons live in caves? I could not live in a cave. I pulled away from him. I'm a fan, remember? I know your tour picks up at the end of January. Who will protect me then? We'll cross that bridge when the time comes. Right now, I need a shower, some clothes, and a hot meal. What's death weed? What did she mean when she said someone had betrayed you? He scratched the stubble on his jaw and shook his head. There are some things best left unexplained. But I'm a botanist. Which is why I'm not keen to share the information. Fine. Whatever. You don't trust me. I get it. Lead the way to my cell. I held my hands out, as if waiting for him to slap cuffs on me. He lowered his brows. I have no intention of locking you away. You heard Esmeralda you need to prove yourself useful. And how exactly do I do that in a place I don't understand, with creatures I thought only existed in fairy tales? Heart motioned to the area around us. Eilish, look at where you are. Tell me what you see. I studied the birch trees, with their graceful white trunks and delicate branches reaching toward the sun. At first glance, they seemed unremarkable beautiful, but nothing special. Then it hit me. The trees, like the druidess, hummed as if they conducted electricity. I pressed my hand to the paper-like bark, and a current of energy seeped into my palm. I feel something, what is it? The aches and pains in my body began to fade, and then I heard it. A song as soft as a lullaby. Though my brain rebelled against the notion the tree was healing me, something deeper and more primal inside of me believed. Magic. Hart pressed his forehead to the tree and closed his eyes. Esmeralda's magic resides in this grove. I don't understand. I had a sinking feeling I would utter those words a hundred times a day while on the island, yet a part of me I hadn't known existed felt at peace. This strange place felt like familiar, like I belonged, like I'd finally come home. The druids and the trees have a symbiotic relationship. No one knows if the magic originated in the trees or with the druids, but they are inexplicably linked. This is why I'm here. It is my sacred duty to guard both the druids and the groves during my clan's lunar cycle. Pride deepened his voice. He stood taller, shoulders broader, hands on his hips. The Clark Kent I'd met on the plane had shed his business attire, and a naked Superman had emerged. She referred to you as a warden of Clan Birch. Is that your ancestral name? The Celtic Zodiac has 13 signs, each is associated with different creatures and personality traits. I was born under Birch Moon, so I am of Clan Birch. 
I had spent years researching druidic practices and had never heard of a Celtic zodiac. What are the personality traits of your clan? We are called the Achievers. We're charismatic leaders who can charm the horns off unicorns. He smiled and for the first time it lit his eyes. What's your birthday? April 28th. He blanched. Is that bad? No, I knew a willow once. They are known as intelligent and perceptive, but tend to be rather serious. Sounds just like me. I couldn't help but wonder what had caused his reaction. But if I had to guess, I'd say he dated someone with my sign. I turned my attention to the dandelions growing at the base of the trees. While not impossible, it was unusual for Taraxicum officinale to sprout in the shade. I knelt to get a better look at the root structure of the plant, and my heart raced. This is incredible. Heart gave me a knowing smile. You will find many incredible things on Eileen Dryacht. I studied this plant in my Archeobotany class. It's been extinct for over two centuries. I wanted to pluck one of the bright yellow blooms for future study, but it sang to me. A different song than the trees, but just as lovely. I couldn't bring myself to harm it. Not to mention, I'd probably never see the inside of a lab again. He ran his hand over the back of his neck. I believe those are used to make wine. Not for medicinal purposes. Despite my melancholy, the possibility of rediscovering long-lost botanical species intrigued me. Hart shrugged. I don't know, but I can introduce you to some who do. Giving the flower one last look, I stood and nodded. Maybe I can make myself useful here after all. Modern medicine has come a long way in the last century. Perhaps I could both learn from and assist your healers. He slung an arm over my shoulder and steered me away from the grove. Maybe, but most here heal when they shift her via magic. The tiny bud of hope inside me withered. Of course they do. The druids and the trees have a symbiotic relationship. No one knows if the magic originated in the trees or with the druids, but they are inexplicably linked. This is why I'm here. It is my sacred duty to guard both the druids and the groves during my clan's lunar cycle. Pride deepened his voice. He stood taller, shoulders broader, hands on his hips. The Clark Kent I'd met on the plane had shed his business attire, and a naked Superman had emerged. She referred to you as a warden of Clan Birch. Is that your ancestral name? The Celtic Zodiac has 13 signs, each is associated with different creatures and personality traits. I was born under Birch Moon, so I am of Clan Birch. I'd spent years researching druidic practices and had never heard of a Celtic zodiac. What are the personality traits of your clan? We are called the Achievers. We're charismatic leaders who can charm the horns off unicorns. He smiled and for the first time it lit his eyes. What's your birthday? April 28th. He blanched. Is that bad? No, I knew a willow once. They are known as intelligent and perceptive, but tend to be rather serious. Sounds just like me. I couldn't help but wonder what had caused his reaction. But if I had to guess, I'd say he dated someone with my sign. I turned my attention to the dandelions growing at the base of the trees. While not impossible, it was unusual for Taraxicum officinale to sprout in the shade. I knelt to get a better look at the root structure of the plant, and my heart raced. This is incredible. Heart gave me a knowing smile. You will find many incredible things on Eileen Dryacht. I studied this plant in my archaeobotany class. It's been extinct for over two centuries. I wanted to pluck one of the bright yellow blooms for future study, but it sang to me. A different song than the trees, but just as lovely. I couldn't bring myself to harm it. Not to mention, I'd probably never see the inside of a lab again. He ran his hand over the back of his neck. I believe those are used to make wine. Not for medicinal purposes. Despite my melancholy, the possibility of rediscovering long-lost botanical species intrigued me. Hart shrugged. I don't know, but I can introduce you to some who do. Giving the flower one last look, I stood and nodded. Maybe I can make myself useful here after all. Modern medicine has come a long way in the last century. Perhaps I could both learn from and assist your healers. He slung an arm over my shoulder and steered me away from the grove. Maybe, but most here either shift of use magic to heal. The tiny bud of hope inside me withered. Chapter 9. Heart. Word of the human had spread across the island quicker than a tabloid news story. Thanks in no small part to Chevon and McGregor, the two were worse than a couple of old women when it came to gossip. Shifters of all varieties had come out to catch a glimpse of Eilish. Some hid in the forest, while others gawked or shouted racial slurs at her, but it seemed like half the damned island had lined the road to my home. I'd grown used to fame in the human world. I had ways of dealing with the paparazzi and droves of fans, like security teams and limos on standby to whisk me away from the crowds. 
I'd never needed such nonsense on Eileen Dreyacht because most of the population didn't give a damn about the outside world. Those who knew of my fame thought I was going through some sort of attention-seeking phase and would snap out of it. I noted those bold enough to make their hatred of humans known. Maybe you should use my sweater like a loincloth or something. Eilish said. They aren't staring at my arse. It's you they came to see. I regretted the words as soon as they rolled off my tongue. Oh. She folded her arms and curled in on herself. Eilish had suffered enough trauma for one day. She didn't need my pissy attitude on top of everything else. She hadn't asked for a babysitter for the next 28 days, but here we were. What were the druids thinking when they turned her over to me? There are racists in every culture. Unfortunately, you're the minority here. Eilish sniffled and wiped her eyes. Her distress had my beast roaring his disapproval to the point I feared I'd lose control and shift. I lowered my voice. Do you still want to see my dragon? My place is a ways off. It's probably best if we fly. She eyed me and shook her head. As you wish. The dried salt water and blood on my skin itched, my head ached, and shifter or not, I seriously wanted a pair of jeans. I should have taken the blonde flight attendant up on her offer to change my seat. Tell me about the hunters. Her question pricked my already strained nerves. Not here. She stopped walking. If this is going to work, I need to understand what I'm up against. I leaned closer. They're cold-blooded killers. Lucky for you, they aren't interested in humans. If I were you I'd be more concerned about the people watching and listening to this conversation. She glanced up with wide eyes. I could smell her fear, which meant those who'd come out to get a look at her could too. Reeking like prey on Eileen Dryack would get her killed far quicker than falling into the North Sea. Stay put. I need to shift and get you out of here. I turned and strode several yards away. What? Why? Where are you going? She took a step in my direction. Nowhere. Please, just stay back. I held up a hand and lowered the walls inside me. A cold trickle of magic traveled down my spine. In a flash of light, skin turned to shimmering white scales, flesh and bone exploded and reformed, my senses sharpened, and my world narrowed to one singular focus Eilish. The foolish woman screamed and made a run for the forest. I roared a warning, not to her, to the shifters in the vicinity. I'd cripple anyone stupid enough to mistake my intended mate for prey and return later to slow roast them into a snack. The shifters along the road stared, but none followed my female. Eilish ran in a zigzag pattern through the trees. Smart. Most humans moved in a straight line, making them far easier to catch. Not that she created much of a challenge. I could find her by scent alone, but my heart swelled with pride at her survival instincts. She is a worthy mate. No. 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 The human part of my brain screamed, but the dragon would have no part of it. I followed until she reached a clearing large enough for me to land without risking hurting her. On the ground, I settled and curled my neck and tail around my body. I couldn't make myself appear small, but I could tone down the scary factor. At least I hoped I could. Eilish trembled like the ending note of a guitar riff, but she took a step forward. Heart. I nodded and exhaled a puff of smoke. This can't be happening. She backed away. My reptilian brain wanted me to snatch her in my claws and carry her away to my lair. Thankfully, her proximity had calmed that side of myself enough to regain some control. I purred, soft and low, and waited for her to come to me. It took far longer than I would have liked, but she inched her way closer. She turned her body sideways and held out her hand. Don't eat me, okay? I'd like very much to taste every square inch of you. The thought deepened my purr. Eilish jumped back and glanced around the clearing. Who's there? I shook my head. No one had come upon us. I would have smelled them from yards away. You're safe with me. Her mouth fell open. Are you speaking to me? You can hear me. Humans couldn't link into a dragon's telepathic speech. Hell, not all shifters could pull it off with those outside their clans. I felt the chains around my neck tightening. Eilish may have felt like a prisoner on the island, but she threatened my freedom more with each passing moment. Yes, how is that possible? I'm not sure. You must have some sort of magic in your lineage. I'd spoken a half-truth. It was possible she'd inherited dragon speak from an ancestor, but unlikely. And I wasn't ready to face the alternative. She can't be my mate. Eilish closed the distance between us and reached for me. May I touch you? I wanted to say no, to take to the sky and get as far away from Eileen Dryacht and her as I could. To hell with the consequences. I had a life, a life with no room for a mate, a life I intended to get back to as soon as my lunar cycle ended. Heart. Her hand in midair, she hesitated. Yes, do as you wish. When you're ready, climb onto my back between my shoulder blades. I'd like to get home sometime before dusk. 
If she'd picked up on my impatience, she showed no signs. Then again, I had a word for humans in her mental state. Dragonstruck. As if she'd been around dragonkin her entire life, Eilish brushed her fingers across the soft scales at the base of the ruffle surrounding my auditory canal. In human terms, she tickled my ear. The sensation sent a shiver from the base of my skull to the tip of my tail. So beautiful. She ran her hand along my neck. Your coloring, it's like opals. Thank you. I lifted my head and tracked her movements along the side of my body. All right, how do I do this? She glanced from my back to my face. Chuckling, I said, you're not going to hurt me. Just grab a spike and climb up. She set her foot on my tail and hoisted herself up, only to slide back down. You make it sound far easier than it is. I can't help it you're tiny, even by human standards. Sensing her second attempt would end like the first, I shoved my muzzle under her arse and gave her a boost. Big mistake. Her scent hit my nostrils like a harpoon in the groin, and for once, my dragon wanted to retreat and allow the man to have a go at her. Eilish gasped and swatted at me with as much effect as a kitten attempting to move a boulder. Personal space. Heart. Personal space. I waited for her to settle, stood and stretched. You'll be safe where you are, but you may want to hang on. Wait. That's a contradictory statement. You'll find I'm full of contradictions. True words had never been spoken. Eilish had my dual natures battling it out. I took to the air before she had time to chicken out. Conscious of her body pressed between my shoulder blades, I took care to keep a steady pace and altitude. No sense in scaring her off flying on our first attempt. Eilish laughed. She freaking laughed and cuddled against me as if she'd ridden hundreds of times. Her reaction thrilled me and deepened the pit in my stomach. I was screwed. Enjoying yourself. This is incredible. Her voice carried on the wind like a melody. I thought you were afraid of flying. She laughed. Only landings and takeoffs. But this is different. I can't talk to an airplane. Are you up for some aerial acrobatics? No, but I'm curious. What exactly did you mean when you said you wanted to taste me? Chapter 10. Eilish. I cannot believe I just asked him that. I wanted to cover my face, but one, he couldn't see my heated cheeks, and two, I'd have to let go of the death grip I had on his spikes. Why Eilish? Are you embarrassed? you're squirming. Heart's voice and laughter filled my head. I would never get used to a dragon speaking directly into my head. I'm pleading the fifth. Yep. I wanted to leap from his back and plummet to my death. I was a science nerd, a bookworm, not the type of woman who came on to men. Heart veered to the right and soared higher. This is the eastern side of the island. The village below is called Deer and Bryn. There are larger towns and cities in the south. This region is more sparsely populated. The mountains are beautiful. My parents had taken me to the Appalachians once when I was in middle school, and I'd fallen in love with the rugged terrain. It seemed like lifetimes since I'd gone on a family vacation. Memories of my childhood blurred my vision. They're small compared to the most mountain ranges, but there are some fantastic hiking trails. His voice grew softer. Is something wrong? I was thinking about my family. I swallowed past the emotion clogging my throat. I'll never see them again, will I? Never is a long time. Heart dipped closer to the sea. I blinked the salt spray from my eyes and focused on a large opening in the cliff. My heart sank. He headed for a cave. A freaking cave. I'd never see my family again, and I'd be living in the Stone Ages with a dragon. Duck your head. He stretched his neck and tucked his wings. One moment we flew through the sunlight. The next we were immersed in total darkness. We emerged through an opening in the ground and into a meadow the likes of which I'd only seen in paintings. Heather, ranging in color from purplish magenta to lavender, covered the expanse and continued up the sides of the rolling hills. The sight stole my breath, and the nagging feeling that I'd been here before overwhelmed me. If you're one of those who dreams of running barefoot through fields of heather, don't. The ground is soft like a bog, and the plant itself will chew your feet to hamburger. So much for all those historical romance novels I'd read. You're a dream killer. He laughed and turned his accent up several notches. Don't worry, Ersulf, lassie. I'm sure your kilt-wearing hero will save your wee feet. Images of a photo spread I'd seen in Rolling Stone, featuring the members of Solstice in kilts, flashed through my mind. I'd stared at those pictures, more specifically, I'd stared at hard in those pictures for hours. Whoa. Those must have been some seriously smutty books. He landed with a dull thud. I had a horrible suspicion I knew the answer before I asked. He'd either felt the heat pooling between my legs, or smelled it. Neither idea thrilled me. Why do you say that? No reason. 
He lowered his massive body to the ground. No reason. Huh. I climbed down and turned toward the house. Only house didn't do the place justice. I'd been so busy fantasizing about heart's legs. I hadn't noticed the structure. It looked as if a traditional Irish cottage and a Franklin Lloyd Wright masterpiece had a sprawling, multi-level, love child. Heavy stone walls created a solid feel to the home, but sheets of glass, wooden beams, and decking gave the place a modern feel. A crow's nest jutted from the top story and probably offered amazing views of the coastline. Weathered copper-colored metal replaced straw thatch on the roof and added a touch of whimsy. None of the components should have gone together. But as a whole, they worked in perfect unison to create a home as unexpected as its owner. Do you like it? Hart, the man, stood beside me with a grin that I couldn't read. He looked almost shy, odd considering he'd spent the last day without clothing. I love it. It's modern but traditional at the same time. The stone walls bordering the front yard drew my attention. I had the sensation of deja vu, but it probably came from the hundreds of photographs of cottages I'd seen when researching the area. His expression brightened. I've owned it since I was a lad and added on to the original structure over the years. Come inside. I'll give you the nickel tour after we've had a chance to clean up and get some food in our bellies. I followed him toward the house. While this beat the heck out of living in a cave, I couldn't help but miss the tiny apartment I shared with Sarah. We'd spent days in Ikea picking out everything from the furniture to the kitchenware. In the end, we'd created a cozy space that reflected both our tastes. I doubted anything about Hart's sprawling estate felt cozy. I was wrong. The moment I walked through the side door, the smell of stew cooking and firewood burning greeted me. The same stonework and beams from the exterior graced the interior of the kitchen and a small sitting area. Dried herbs hung from a rack, alongside copper pots and pans. I half expected to find Grandma Lawson knitting in the corner. What I didn't expect was the drummer of Solstice wearing an apron. Heart motioned to the guy. Eilish, this is Ian. Ian, Eilish. Pleasure to meet you. The bearded redhead offered me a smile and heart a smirk. What the hell, dude? Put some clothes on. Nobody wants to see that. He glanced down as if he'd forgotten his current state of undress. Yeah, we're going upstairs to get a shower. Ian cocked a brow. Separate showers. I added before anyone got any big ideas. Nice to meet you too. I'd shake your hand, but I'm filthy and smell like a dead whale. Ian's blue-eyed gaze traveled the length of my body. You smell like salted caramel, and I, for one, appreciate filthy women. Heart growled. Not a playful sound. Not a groan. An honest-to-goodness growl that caused the hair on my arms to rise. Ian held his hands up lowered his head, and took a step back. Message received. I glanced between the men. What message? Ian opened his mouth to reply, but snapped it shut. Thanks for cooking, but I'm sure you have other things to attend to at your place. Hart's voice had turned icy. Is it true, what they are saying about the hunters off the coast? Ian untied the apron. Hart glanced at me before turning back to his bandmate. Yes, I took a harpoon to the wing. That's why Eilish and I crash-landed in the ocean. A harpoon, but you flew here. I recalled him saying something about shifting and healing, but I hadn't thought to ask for details. Then again, I'd suffered from information overload since I'd arrived on the island. Wait, was that what caused the puncture wound? Yes. You and I will sit down and have a long conversation soon. I promise. Shoulder sagging, Hart turned back to Ian. They laced their weapon with death weed poison. Alert the others to be careful out there tonight. Ian's eyes rounded. Damn. How the hell did they get their hands on that? No clue, but I gave Esmeralda a heads up. If anyone can find the culprit, she can. Ian tapped his fingers on the countertop. Who healed you? Hart folded his arms. No clue. Someone bandaged me up when I was passed out. I would have woken if someone moved you. I left out the part about cuddling with him for warmth. You'd be surprised what mild hypothermia, swallowing 10 gallons of seawater, and hauling 220 pounds of muscle out of the ocean can do to a person. You were probably out cold. Hart chuckled. I'd gone from one male-dominated career to another. I'd learned how to stand up to men who spoke down to me because I lacked a penis. Actually, I wouldn't be surprised. I spent four years working air-sea rescue in the Navy. Ian turned his head to hide his smile. My apologies. Hart stared as if he had something more to say, but glanced away. 
The drummer cleared his throat, likely to break the tension. I'd rather you be the one to report the attack to the other wardens at the briefing. I won't be there tonight. Esmeralda made it clear Eilish is my primary duty. No shit. He looked at me as if I'd suddenly become more than a set of breasts and a pretty face. I'd understood what they said, but I'd missed the meaning. I'd majored in botany, but I'd taken enough biology classes to understand pack behavior. Hart was clearly the dominant male, as he'd been with Chev on that morning. The growling seemed to be a more civilized version of peeing to mark his territory, but when had I become Hart Lawson's territory? Better question. How did I feel about that? As if he'd heard my thoughts, Hart took my hand and led me up a flight of stairs. The den, my study, and two guest rooms are on this floor. I gave the room a quick glance, but I had more important things on my mind than the floorplan. Are all of the members of Solstice Dragons? Dustin, he's born under the birch moon like me. The others are human. He motioned for me to go up a spiral staircase. That's why he's here at the same time as you. You're both on duty this month. I reached the top and stopped short. The sky had turned from greatest streaks of color, ranging from peach to dark purple. Hart moved behind me and rested his hand on my hip. I love the face you make when you're awestruck. The touch of his hand sent a ripple of heat through my body. The urge to press against him overwhelmed me. But before I gathered the courage, he turned away. Standing with his back to me, Hart cleared his throat. You're in the room on the right. It has a private bath. I'll be through the double doors in the master. Don't try to run, Eilish. I'll hear you before you reach the second floor. Any thought of pressing any part of me against any part of him ended with the not-so-gentle reminder of my situation. I need clothes. There's a robe in the closet and toiletries in the vanity drawers. He stopped toward his bedroom. I'll come and get you when I'm ready to have dinner. I opened my mouth to tell him I'd rather eat in my room, but he slammed his door before I could form the words. His Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde behavior had worn thin. I might be a mere mortal, but I refused to allow some overgrown lizard to boss me around. And I planned to tell him so once I didn't smell like seaweed. Chapter 11. Heart. My shower ranked at the top of my favorite places in the world. The walk-in had enough space for five people, multiple heads that sprayed from all directions, and a built-in sound system, but none of that mattered. This was the one place I could think. Standing beneath the water, I took a mental inventory of my life. I'd always prided myself on not becoming one of those morose rock stars that bitched and moaned about how hard they had it. I'd lived long enough to know I was blessed. Eventually, I'd have to give it all up before the humans started to notice I hadn't aged. I'd lay low for several decades and re-emerge as the next big thing. Music was as much a part of me as the dragon. I loved what I did. The fans. The songs. The thrill of walking onto a stage and pouring my soul out for the world. When it all became too much, I'd return home to Eileen Dreyacht and let my dragon stretch his wings. I had more wealth than I could ever spend. Bandmates that were like brothers to me. And all the women a man could want. Unlike most of the inhabitants of the island, I'd chosen to walk the line between the two worlds, taking the best of each and fashioning a life that most would envy. More importantly, I had my freedom, which was more than I could say for Eilish. Through no fault of her own, she'd stumbled into an impossible situation, an impossible situation my raging libido had made more difficult. What had I been thinking, flirting with her? Despite what my dragon or my libido wanted, I had no intentions of taking her as my mate, but I could make things more comfortable for both of us. We had 28 days before I would fly to London and rejoin my bandmates. 28 days under the same damned roof. Seeing her. Smelling her. Touching her. I'm not going to spend them fighting with her or the dragon. I'm too old for that nonsense. She knows the score, knows I'm leaving. I'll give her the time of her freaking life until then. Now that I had the Eilish situation settled, I turned off the water and went into my closet for two pairs of pajama pants and t-shirts. What kind of a prick insisted a woman wear a bathrobe to dinner? I'd give Chev on a call and ask her to bring more suitable clothes for Eilish in the morning. Until then she'd have to make do with mine. I brushed the fuzz from my teeth, put a comb through my hair, and headed to the guest room. Eilish, I've brought you some PJs. I got nothing. No reply. No sound of running water. Nothing. I tried the knob. But she'd locked the door. Knocking, I called out to her again. Come on, Eilish. Open the door. Silence. I would have heard her go down the metal stairs. 
but the room had a balcony. It was too high off the ground for her to have jumped, but she'd surprised me before. Though McGregor had helped. It had taken a hell of a lot of strength to pull me from the shallows and away from the water. Last chance. Answer me, or I'm coming in. I ran my hand over the top of the doorframe and retrieved the key. The lock turned, but I hesitated. I leash. I stepped inside. The room looked undisturbed except for her clothing in a heap near the bathroom. I walked to the French doors. Stepped onto the deck. And paused. She'd fallen asleep in the lounge chair. The navy blue robe obscured her curves. But the splash of damp hair across her pale skin made my chest tighten. She was beautiful. And stupid. Despite the magically enhanced warmth of the inlet. The temperatures had dropped after the sun had set. She's lucky her hair hasn't frozen to the chair. I scooped her up like a small child and cradled her to my chest. She sighed and nuzzled closer. A half a second later, her eyes flew open and she flailed like a fish on the shore. What are you doing? Put me down. I will, once I get you inside and warm. I'd received more than my fair share of dirty looks from women. But her expression promised pain. And retribution. And murder. Though I knew better than to tease a cornered jungle cat. I grinned. She thrust her hips up, stiffened her limbs, and flung herself away from me. The move took me off guard enough. I loosened my grip to keep from harming her. Eilish landed on her hands and knees. But sprang to her feet quicker than I would have thought possible. Are you nuts? I motioned to the railing. You could have fallen to your death. Glaring, she tugged the rope tighter. You may be my captor, but you don't get to manhandle me. Manhandle? Is she serious? You were asleep. I didn't want you to freeze. Did it ever occur to you to wake me? She smirked and shook her head. Or put me down when I asked you to. I raised my hands. I'm not going to stand out here and argue. Let's go inside. And discuss boundaries like mature adults. She made an exasperated sound and pushed past me. I'm starving. May I have permission to go to the kitchen, master? I grinned again. I couldn't help it. Something about her calling me master. Flipped on the part of my brain that enjoyed porn and dirty jokes. What's so funny? She folded her arms. I took a step closer. And much to my surprise. She held her ground. Gods above and below, this woman. So help me. If you pick me up again. She glanced around as if looking for something to clobber me with. I closed the distance. And pushed into her personal space. She smelled like soap in my detergent and sex. I brushed her hair back from her face. And met her gaze. She glanced to my mouth and drew a breath. Half expecting her to slap me. I leaned down and brushed my lips across hers. The moment I touched her. I knew it wouldn't be enough. The kiss. As chaste as it was. Had ignited the part of my soul that created music and poetry. The part that I kept locked away from the world. Even as I belted out my innermost thoughts to packed stadiums. Heart. Eilish pulled away. This is a bad idea. We barely know each other. And you're leaving in a couple of weeks. I stared. Not comprehending. Her trembling voice and hands had betrayed her. As did her lips when she'd kissed me back. She wanted this. I knew it. She knew it. But she'd said no. I understand. I heard myself tell the lie. And forced myself to smile. Let's get you fed. Eilish hung her head. A war raged behind her dark eyes. A different battle than the one I fought. But they were two sides of the same coin. I wanted her until I had to go. She wanted me only if I agreed to stay. Chapter 12 Eilish Hart Lawson's presence surrounded me. I sat in his kitchen, wearing his clothes, tasting the residue of his lips on mine. Few would argue the man had charisma, but I'd grossly underestimated its effect on me. Though a half hour had passed, my skin still tingled where he'd touched me, and I doubted I would ever forget his expression after he'd kissed me. The man should seriously consider a career in acting. Hart stood and went for his second helping of stew. Eilish. About what happened upstairs. I don't want to talk about it. I pushed chunks of meat and vegetables around in my bowl. Fair enough. He dug into his food, but his gaze remained on me. But, if you did want to talk. I don't. I stood and unceremoniously dumped the remainder of my dinner into the sink. All I'm saying is. I flipped the switch to the garbage disposal and let the sound drown out his voice. Rude, I know. But I could hardly discuss something I had yet to wrap my head around. The basic situation was simple. He would leave the island and return to his life. And I wouldn't. How I did or did not feel about that changed nothing. 
Hart came up for air and pushed his bowl away. It'd be great if you took over the cooking and cleaning. While you're here, I have responsibilities. And I should work on some new music in my downtime. Cooking and cleaning? Was he for real? I could hardly boil water, let alone feed a dragon. Or a man with a dragon-sized appetite. Want me to do your laundry, too. He leaned back and clasped his hands behind his head. That'd be great. I have a badger shifter that comes in once a week. Nice lady. But it's probably best if you keep your distance. She's had a thing for me for years. And badgers are territorial. I should have expected someone like him to be a misogynist. I'd read enough articles about him to know he went through women, as most men went through socks. Think you can help me put the leftovers into a container? Or is that too much for you? He tilted his head to the side. I can bench press a minivan. I think I can handle a pot of stew. I folded my arms and gave him my best death stare. You sure? I mean, what if your penis gets in the way while you're rummaging through your Tupperware cabinet? He glanced away, furrowed his brow, and whipped his head in my direction. Oh. Ha ha. I'm not a male chauvinist. I'm in favor of equitable distribution of resources. What the heck does that mean? He carried his dishes to the sink and inserted himself into my personal space. I believe whoever is better at a task should do it, regardless of their gender. I stepped back until my butt hit the counter. That's crap. He set his hands on either side of me. His proximity made it difficult to breathe. Take lifting a heavy box. For instance, I'm physically stronger than you. It makes more sense for me to do the lifting. That doesn't mean you can't move the box or shouldn't move the box. Only that it takes less energy for me to do it. Whatever you need to tell yourself, heart, but you assumed I was better at cooking and cleaning than you. I pushed him, but I might as well have been trying to move a block of granite. No, love. I thought you might enjoy having something to do. You strike me as the type who'd want to earn her keep. Besides, you know what they say about idle hands. He leaned as close as possible without actually touching me. I had to put some distance between us before I did something foolish like run my hand down his rock-hard chest to his rock-hard. Damn it. Stop thinking about sex. Fine. But I'm warning you. My cooking skills aren't on par with Ian's. He flashed the same grin he'd worn on the cover of Maxim last September. Dragons aren't picky. We'll eat anything. The low purr in his voice made my body riot against my common sense. Thankfully. A knock at the kitchen door saved me from myself. Hart pulled back. Unfortunately, he remained far too close. Come in, Chavon. I blinked and opened my mouth to ask how he knew she was outside. But he shook his head a fraction of an inch. I brought the human some clothes. The fox shifter stood with one hand on her hip and a less than friendly expression on her face. An expression that changed the moment Hart turned toward her. Thanks. He motioned to the pot on the stove. The inmates stew if you're hungry. You started without me? She glanced from him to the food, and finally to me. The disappointment in her voice surprised me. While I didn't know her, I suspected a reaction was real. Hart winced and ran his hand over the back of his neck. Sorry, lass. With everything going on, I hadn't seen food since my last flight. Sit, please. I'll get you some stew. I busied myself with searching the cabinets for his dishes. Thanks, Eilish. He offered me an apologetic smile. No thanks. It isn't the same eating alone. Chevon dropped a bag on the floor and her butt into a chair. After all these years, I still don't understand why you insist on traveling like a human. I could feel her glaring but chose to ignore it. I'd received her message loud and clear. Time and familiarity had given her a claim on heart. Smiling, I turned to him. I'm beat. I think I'll turn in early tonight. He took my hand and tugged me toward him. Stay up a while longer. We can sleep in tomorrow. If looks could kill, my fingers would have withered and died. Chevon's smile melted into a snarl. Where's Ian run off to? He had things to do. Hart rested his hip against the kitchen island. So you forgot all about our tradition and threw him out on his ass? I suppose you'll be wanting me to go too. She glanced anywhere but at me. He slung his arm over my shoulder. If you wouldn't mind, Eilish is right. It's been a long one. We'll do our welcome home party another night. Maybe tomorrow. My heart went out to the other woman. I hated that I'd ruined their plans and wanted nothing more than to leave the room. However, he seemed to need me to stay either as an excuse or a human shield. Maybe both. I'm busy tomorrow. She narrowed her eyes as if daring him to ask her to leave. You wouldn't be avoiding me. Would you now? 
Hart laughed, but his shoulders had tensed. Why would I avoid you? It's my 50th year. I had the strangest sensation. It felt like someone had put my muscles into a taffy puller and turned the crank. Every inch of my body tightened until it ached. I eased from beneath his arm, and the tension stopped. What in the world? Hart stared at me with the molten silver eyes of his dragon. Hart. I'm still here waiting for you to answer me. We talked about this. He turned his head and spoke to her as a parent might speak to a teenager. Stern, but exhausted. Ian and I are too busy on the road to escort a young shifter into the human world. Young. Hadn't she said she'd just turned 50? She certainly behaved like a girl with a crush, but I'd placed her as a few years younger than me, somewhere in her late 20s. That's bullshit. Shevon shot to her feet. This is because of the human. Isn't it? You're already talking about her like she's the lady of the house. All the wheeze and us He folded his arms. It has nothing to do with Eilish. My answer's been the same for the past five years. The woman, or girl, or fox or whatever she was, snatched the bag from the floor and marched to the back door. I whispered, she's in love with you. Hart pulled me into an embrace. She's a girl with a crush, who sees me as her way off the island. It'll pass once she finds her mate. If you say so, I furrowed my brow. Wait, what exactly do you mean by mate? Chapter 13. Heart. Of all the women in the world, the airlines had assigned the seat next to mine to a scientist. Not just any scientist. A beautiful one. Who made my dragon behave like an overgrown child clinging to the most prized toy in the box. As per usual. I'd spoken without thinking. I'd mentioned the word mate to Eilish. And her freaking researcher's mind had latched onto the term. Husband. Boyfriend. Whatever you want to call it. Shavon's young. She has a crush. It'll pass when she meets the one. She tapped her index finger against her lips. Yes. But I find your word choice interesting. Different species of animals have different practices. Depending on the breed, vulpine either mate for life, practice polygyny or pick new mates each breeding season. Of course, I'm not factoring in her human side. Her words might have trailed off, but I could all but see the thoughts tumbling around in her head. I braced myself for questions. Exactly how does it work? Are you more animal than human or vice versa? She laughed before I could answer. Silly question. I know you're more human than dragon because you spoke to me in words telepathically. Your body changes but your mind is intact. It varies. Each type of shifter and individual is different. But to answer your question, my dragon and I are one in the same. I spoke the truth. Or at least it had been the truth up until the moment she'd walked onto the plane. Why do I get the feeling you're holding something back? She grinned and slid her arms around my waist. My dragon purred. She'd reached for me. Not because she was frightened or in danger, but because she wanted to. I drew her closer and pressed a kiss to the top of her head. Because there's more to it. There have been times when my more primal nature wants something that doesn't work for my more rational side. I can say the same though. I want to eat a dozen donuts or stay in bed all day. But I know my actions have consequences. Eilish nuzzled into my neck. What about dragons? Do they mate for life? Some do. Some are polyamorous and share a mate with another dragon. And others live solitary lives. I needed to get her off the topic before I dug myself deeper into a conversation. I had no intention of having. I captured her chin between my thumb and forefinger and tilted her face toward mine. Her eyes fluttered closed. And I took it as an invitation to kiss her. Eilish had the sort of lips that were full of contradictions. Sinful and sweet. Urgent and reserved. Demanding and delicate. I had the feeling I could taste them hundreds of times and never grow bored. Between my dragon and my poet soul. She would be the end of me. I pulled away. Eilish. I. In the movies. Females placed a single finger on a man's lips to quiet him. But Eilish was no heroine dreamed up by some screenwriter. He covered my mouth with her entire hand and met my eyes with a determination that shocked the living shit out of me. Heart. I'm not stupid. I know how this will work out. You're going back on tour. But I'll never leave this island. As I said before, I understand the consequences. I struggled to make sense of her conflicting words and actions. Right. But you shot me down upstairs. She lowered her gaze. It occurred to me that this time with you might be my last chance at happiness. I should take it. Her trembling voice snapped my willpower like a broken guitar string. My dragon rammed against the barriers keeping him inside. He wanted to lay at her feet and do whatever it took to make her smile. 
For once. I agreed. I pulled her to my chest. Slid my hands to her thighs. And lifted her from the ground. Eilish made a yelping sound that made me hard. She laced her fingers behind my neck and wrapped her legs around my waist. Before I could say a word. She crushed my lips with hers. This time. There was no contradiction in the kiss. Only desire. I thank the gods and goddesses for my supernatural strength. A mere human could never have navigated the stairs without dropping the rather distracting woman. Her tongue tangling with mine sent a burst of lust through me. I hadn't given much thought to what she wore beneath the bathrobe until my fingers dug into her bare arse. I missed a step, but Eilish didn't seem to notice. She'd taken full advantage of our aligned bodies to grind against me. Roaring for me to claim her. My dragon battered against his barrier. I took a step inside and sank to my knees. Eilish broke the kiss long enough to yank my t-shirt over my head. I needed to slow things down. To look at her. To savor the moment. But my brain had disconnected from my body. Easing her to the floor. I lowered my mouth to her chest and lost myself in the feel of her flesh. The dragon urged me to bite her. To break her skin and mark her as mine. But I couldn't. I wouldn't do that to either of us. I shifted my weight and settled between her thighs. Her scent called to not only the dragon, but something deep within my soul. I'd never been so turned on, so needy that I had to fight myself not to turn her over and slam into her like an animal. Eilish was human, a fragile thing compared to me. I wouldn't risk hurting her. The first taste of her sent me spiraling into a crescendo of sensations and emotions. I had to get control of myself or it'd be over far too quickly. Stop. She curled her fingers in my hair and jerked my head back. Heart. Wait. Something's wrong. I glanced up the long line of her body and met her wide eyes. Wrong. Her shoulders shook with each labored breath. But I struggled to keep from staring at her breasts. I can't explain. My body aches. Not like sex aches. It hurts. And my thoughts. She pushed herself to her elbows. My mouth went dry. I wanted to pull her close. But I didn't dare touch her. I'd shared Ashlings. My former mates. Emotions and thoughts but only when she was in danger. The idea I could share an even deeper bond with another woman made my throat tighten. Tell me what you were thinking. Blood. I was thinking about biting you or digging my nails into your back. Her voice lowered as if she were ashamed. The physical distance. As well as the sobering conversation. Had quelled the beast enough for me to break through my lust-induced fog. I drew a breath to steady myself. You're reacting to my dragon. Sharing his thoughts and emotions. And mine. But I wasn't ready to share that with anyone. Not yet. You want to tear me to ribbons and eat me. Eilish sat upright and pulled the rope closed. No. Nothing so violent. Shifters have a habit of leaving love marks on each other. Scratches. Little nibbles. Hickeys. She wrapped her arms around her knees. I don't understand. I've read the tabloids. I know you have sex with lots of women. How has no one told a reporter about this? It hasn't happened with anyone else. At least not in a very, very long time. I reached for her. But she recoiled. I pressed my back against the wall and settled in for a long conversation. Eilish. Love. I believe you're meant to be my mate. Chapter 14. Eilish. Mate. There was that word again. Only this time Hart had used it in reference to me. I sat in stunned silence. But the man, who I assumed had just done the shifter equivalent of professing his love, looked miserable. Sitting with his back against the wall, he closed his eyes and drew a long, slow breath. You asked before if dragons mated for life. I had. And now that I thought about it, he dodged the question with a kiss. We do. He turned his gaze toward the window. Long ago, I had a mate. Her name was Ashling. She was killed by hunters. The pain in his voice broke my heart, but I pressed on. Long ago. I met Ashling when I was Shevon's age. We were together for two decades before she was taken from me. He glanced at me. I'm over 300 years old. Somehow, I'd accepted the fox shifter's age without much of a problem. But my brain rebelled against the idea of this man walking the earth for over three centuries. Dragons can live thousands of years. His voice lowered. Some never find a mate. But it seems the fates have given me two. I wanted to blame his melancholy on memories of the woman he'd lost. But I couldn't shake the feeling that his mood had more to do with me. Pushing to my feet, I offered him my hand. 
Relax. I don't believe in fate or luck. Or mates. I believe in science. Falling in love is a chemical reaction in the brain. Likely a holdover from prehistoric times when the survival of the species depended upon finding the strongest, healthiest partner, and having babies. He smirked and shook his head. After everything you've seen on Eileen Dreit, how can you put your faith in science? Given a suitable sample size, the correct variables, and conditions, anything can be proven or negated? I stuff my hands in my pockets. Shifters, dragons, even magic, have a scientific explanation. Hart flashed me his album cover grin. Explain magic to me in scientific terms. Okay, shifters, for example, are probably an undiscovered species, a mutation of multiple species, or a step in the evolutionary process. I'm sure there are laws of nature that apply to all of you like there are with humans. I mean, it's not like a druid pulled you out of a hat. You were born or hatched or created somehow. Born? He looked as if he held back laughter. And magic. How is it that Eileen Dreyck exists, but is unseen and impenetrable by humans? It's not impenetrable. I'm human. And I crossed it. I'm not so sure others can't do the same. But they don't see the island. Lucky for me. I'd already contemplated the question. I plopped down on his gigantic bed. Whoever created the barrier around the island must have discovered a new law of physics that allows them to manipulate matter, or light, or the currents, perhaps all three. I'd have to study it, speak to the person who made it, and recreate it to say for certain. He rubbed the stubble on his jaw. I'll agree that magic follows certain rules, and if they were known to humans, someone in a lab coat could form hypotenuses and prove it exists. Hypothesis. They'd form a hypothesis I giggled and waved my hand. Forget it. His cheeks flushed. I'm a poet and a musician, not a scientist. I'm happy to learn you aren't good at everything. I smiled though I felt every inch of the distance between us. Prehistoric drive to procreate, or not. I craved his touch. Let me see if I understand. I experienced your thoughts and physical responses. Because we are mates. Potential mates. We haven't bonded yet. All right, now we're getting somewhere. There have been many studies of identical twins who report the same type of phenomenon. Perhaps, my reactions to you. Our reactions to each other. He stood and walked to the bed. The idea of him feeling me, the same way I felt him thrilled, and terrified me. You share my thoughts. Hart brushed his fingertips across my cheek. Not yet, but I might if we were fully mated. I leaned into his touch. What exactly does that mean? The bonding itself involves marking each other during the act of lovemaking. There's a ceremony to announce to the community we're mated. But it's more of an excuse to have a party. Other shifters can scent a bonded pair with or without the ritual. I wrinkled my nose. Overdeveloped olfactory glands. Add in magic. He ran his hand through the length of my hair. Okay, so we have sex, scar each other, and there's an optional ceremony. Is that it? He sat beside me. Mates find it difficult to be apart. They can sense the other's location and emotions. Some can communicate telepathically. The bond varies. But it's always intense. As if my body wanted to prove his point. His grief hung over me like a heavy cumulonimbus bus cloud. I didn't understand why. But I had a sudden need to ask about Ashling. How did you survive when she died? He stiffened his spine and jerked away. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to pry. I couldn't have read it, or heard it, or learned about it in class. But I knew the loss of a mate meant the other would most likely perish. Bonded pairs usually follow each other to the grave. The druids say I lived because we were young and newly mated. He stood and paced as if he could walk off the memories. Seconds dragged into minutes before he stopped and turned to me. I don't have room in my life for a woman. He's afraid to love again. The thought came to me as if someone else had whispered it into my ear. My heart ached for him, but his rejection hurt more. I refused to turn into one of those pathetic women who made excuses for men. Instead, I grabbed hold of my pain and anger. First of all, I have no intention of being your mate or anything else. If you remember, I offered no strings attached sex, not a proposal. Second, I'm well aware of your great big life. I have one too. A family and friends and a career I will never get back to. Because I chose to throw a life preserver to what I thought was a drowning man. Third, you can kiss my ass. Hart's mouth moved, but no sound came out. I stood and yanked the robe tighter. I want to speak to Esmeralda. Call her or use magic or send a carrier pigeon shifter. Do whatever you have to. But I'm leaving this house in the morning. Eilish. 
With my head held high, I walked into my room, closed the door, and turned the lock. I had a sense of Hart's frustration, but beneath it, his sadness threatened to consume me. No. Eilish. Pull yourself together and think logically. He's upset because he's thinking about his deadmate. This has nothing to do with you. For the first time in my life, rationalizing my emotions had left me hollow. Chapter 15. Heart. The towering trees in the birch grove had a way of humbling me. As large as my life, career, or ego grew, I would never stand as long or as tall as the sacred trees. They had seen and felt more than I would in three dragon lifetimes. I pressed my hand against the papery bark and closed my eyes. Ancient magic hummed through my body and seeped into my soul. The sacred song of my people. Our history. Our fate grew louder until my heart beat in rhythm with the bass tones. This is what brought me back to Eileen Dryacht every December. Peace and oneness with those who came before and those still to come. Warden. You've returned. Esmeralda's voice blended with the music from the trees. I knelt before her. What is today lucky for? Druidus. People. Magical and mundane. Had asked druids the same question since the beginning of time. It was a sign of respect. But more so. A signal that one had come seeking assistance or advice. Esmeralda and her kind had the ability to see the future. Among other things, in ancient times, druids chose which days to battle, which to rest, and which to celebrate. Rise. My sister's mate. Heart of Clan Birch. She laughed. You tell me what luck comes today. For I believe you already know. I met her gaze, and for the first time in as long as I could remember, I saw only Esmeralda. As Ashling's twin. They were identical on the outside, but inside, the two were very different. My mate had a wild streak that years of training hadn't tamed. I'd often wondered what changes Ashling would have brought to Eileen Dryat, and the Druids, had she survived. My intuition tells me you know the answer. But the look upon your face tells me you are not yet ready to speak them aloud. She turned and motioned for me to follow. Your intuition is correct. I shoved my hands in my pockets and walked with her to a stream. It is rare to find two mates in one lifetime. Esmeralda stared into the rushing water. Many are destined to be alone. I nodded, because what could I say? Between her magic and her position among our people, her chances of finding a mate were about as good as being struck by lightning 33 seconds after winning the lottery. Do you love her? She glanced at me from the corner of her eye. My dragon recognized Eilish as his after one sniff. I hesitated to explain further. Admitting I had feelings for another woman felt like a betrayal to her sister. You and the beast are one soul. Heart. She turned and folded her arms. I miss Ashling. Too. But most spirits return in a few years. A decade at the longest. It's likely she's come and gone from this world many times without crossing either of our paths. I'd long since given up hope that my mate would be reincarnated, if I were honest. I questioned the druid's belief in soul rebirth. However, I hadn't considered Ashling could be reborn without my knowledge. Is that possible? For her to have walked the earth without me feeling her pull? You would have felt... something. She held my gaze as if waiting for me to put the pieces together. Why are you being so cryptic? Tell me what it is you want me to know. I can't tell you what you're not willing to hear. Well, that's just great. Have you spent so much time in the human world? You've forgotten our teachings. Esmeralda gave me a patient smile, but I could see the pain behind her kaleidoscope eyes. I shrugged because I knew better than to share my doubts. I had to tread lightly, or I'd end up ordered to permanently return to Eileen Dryack earlier than I'd anticipated. What would happen if she returned? I know the process. Ashling's soul would be born into another body. But how would it work if I take another mate, and she returns? That is not a question I can answer. Open your heart and the truth will reveal itself to you. The druidess wiped a tear from her cheek, faced me, and smiled. Tell me. Heart. Warden of Clan Birch. What is today lucky for? Letting go, my voice cracked. Of the past. Or of the future. Her words burned like feedback through headphones. Why don't you tell me? 
because I sure as hell don't know. I knew my place. I knew my duty. I knew she deserved my respect, but I'd come here for answers. And received nothing but questions. The situation with Eilish had me searching parts of myself I'd stopped analyzing after Ashling died. Just like I had no one complaining when I left my dirty clothes on the floor. I no longer had someone inspiring me to become a better man. And I liked it that way. Esmeralda placed her hand on my shoulder. Send the woman to me. I sighed. Partly because she hadn't reprimanded me. And partly because Eilish had asked to see the druidess. Maybe Esmeralda needed to spend time with the human before she could tell me what to do. At least that was the lie I told myself. I will. When should I return for guidance? She tossed her long red curls over her shoulder and laughed. I suspect you will have your answers soon enough. Esmeralda hadn't handed out punishment for my rudeness. But she sure as hell would take the opportunity to teach me a lesson. Her laughter echoed through the grove long after she'd vanished into the trees. Three hours later. I'd replayed every word, gesture, and undertone of the conversation with the druidess, and still came up empty. Surely. She'd said or hinted at a resolution. Esmeralda was Ashling's sister. For Lug's sake. How could she be so nonchalant about my taking another mate? I had no bloody idea how long I'd wandered, but when I stopped sulking, I found myself outside the pub in Dearnbrin. The druidess might have scrambled my brains, but my body knew how to take the edge off. I slid onto a stool and ordered a pint. The leprechaun bartender, with an attitude large enough to make up for what he lacked in height, eyed me. You're the birch lizard with the human female. What's it to you? I allowed the dragon to peer out my eyes. It was petty. But the wee asshole had picked the wrong day to piss me off. American pop culture had leprechauns all wrong. They weren't happy little guys with blue horseshoes, green clovers, and blue diamonds. But they were magically delicious. In fact, Picturing this one seasoned with Cajun spices made my mouth water. I won't be serving any human lovers in this establishment. He puffed out his chest. I could have pulled rank. Reminded him I was one of the wardens here to protect the island from people capable of taking out dragons. But I doubted it would matter. I'd have better luck getting a straight answer from a druid than I would arguing with a racist. I won't forget your hospitality. And folks around here won't forget you brought filth into our sanctuary. She must be one hell of a lay to bring disgrace to a warden. I had the leprechaun across the bar, and dangling by his shirt, before I'd realized I'd lunged for him. The little gnat kicked and scratched but couldn't break free. I shook him, hard enough to get his attention. You racist piece of garbage. You're not fit to clean her toilet. Heart. Put Owen down. Ian chuckled from the doorway. He's as agreeable as a hemorrhoid. But he pours a good drink. I dropped the guy. Yeah. I wouldn't know. Lucky charms over there won't serve a human lover. Then he won't be having my business either. Ian spat on the floor. This is my pub. I have a right to refuse service to anyone I please. Owen straightened his clothing. Keep this up. And you won't have any patrons to turn away. I turned for the door. The leprechaun's expression darkened. Stinking dragons. Your brains are too small to understand we're superior. They are one step away from monkeys. And there are plenty of folks around here who agree with me. I spun on my heel to crack his skull and show him the size of his grey matter. But Ian grabbed my arm and pulled me to the door. He's not worth it. Come on. He slung his arm over my shoulder. We'd walked two blocks before either of us spoke. But people stared. I suppose it wasn't every day they saw two pissed off dragons storming down the street. Ian lowered his voice. Likely to avoid drawing more attention. It's easy to forget our kind are just as narrow-minded as those in the human world. I pointed back toward the pub. Bullshit like that is going to get Eilish hurt. Or worse. They'll simmer down once the druids make it known they've accepted her. I rounded on him. Really? You honestly believe people like that piece of shit, Owen, are going to welcome her with open arms? Because the druids decide to allow her to live here? He glanced around. Turned to me and squirt his shoulders. No but I can think of one way to make things easier on her. Yeah? Claim her. For the love of law. Make her your mate and no one would be stupid enough to hurt her. First Esmeralda, and now Ian. I ran my hand over my jaw. And why would I do that? You tell me. What's the story? And don't say nothing. You practically pissed on her to mark your territory. 
When I flirted with her, I debated what to tell him. I trusted Ian with my life, but we'd rarely spoken about women. Met her on a plane. He laughed loud enough. Several people looked in our direction. No freaking way. She's clued us at fifty thousand feet. Making a mental note to delete the tweets, I walked toward the village square. One and the same. She ended up on the same ferry. The rest is history. Right. History. He followed me. There was no sense in denying it. Ian had already put two and two together. My dragon likes the way she smells. A lot. And. And I don't want to tie myself down to a woman. Think about the band. The music. Ian stopped walking. Screw the band. We have maybe five years before someone notices we haven't aged. Then if we stop touring, I pulled my shirt over my head. I need to shift. Esmeralda ordered me to bring Eilish to her. Ian stepped closer and lowered his voice. Did it ever occur to you that you can claim her and return her to her life? You've never been mated. You don't know how hard it is to be away from each other. That would eat me alive. I stepped out of my jeans and bundled my clothes into a tight ball. You selfish son of a birch. You don't think it'll hurt her when you leave? She's lost everything, and if she's half as gone for you as you are for her, you're going to break her heart. It won't come to that. This conversation is over. I turned my back to him and called my dragon into existence. The hell it won't. The inn had stood too close to me when I shifted and ended up pinned beneath my tail. Get off me and pull your head out of your ass. My head is where it needs to be. I sat back on my haunches. Oh yeah. I have a pretty good view of your hole right now, and I definitely see your face. Chapter Sixteen, Eilish. Spices and the familiar scent of apples warmed me before I'd taken a sip of my cider. I'd spent the better part of two weeks with Esmeralda in the orchard. She'd instructed me on the ancient names and healing properties of various trees, plants, and flowers. For my part, I relayed their modern uses in the names of the pharmaceuticals derived from their chemical compounds. What is that? It looks like Viscum album, but I've never seen mistletoe with purple berries. My heart pounding, I set my mug on the ground and inspected the strange plant. Relaxing in a patch of grass, Esmeralda plucked leaves from her dress and hair. You are correct. It is mistletoe from Tasmania, but it hasn't grown there since prehistoric times. The only known fossilized evidence of Triculpites, the massy places it extinct over 30 million years ago. I carefully clipped a piece of the mysterious plant and placed it in waxed paper. Esmeralda shrugged. Come, there are things other than plants we should speak of. I felt my cheeks flush. I'd done it. I'd outnerded a druid. The very people who loved plants as much as I did. Don't be embarrassed. Your love of nature and healing is commendable. But life is meaningless without balance. I sat and sipped my quickly cooling cider. It's time for you to return to Hart. He will be here soon to collect you. She spoke as if discussing the weather, when in reality, the idea of spending time with a man who'd flat out rejected me made my stomach hurt. Will I be allowed to continue my work with you? I hated how desperate I sounded, but in the short time I'd spent with Esmeralda, I'd grown to love her. He's leaving in ten days. She rested her hand on mine. I'd like for you to stay with him until he returns to the human world. I wanted to protest, but something in her expression changed my mind. The druidess's eyes had lost their mirth. Even more troubling, she seemed to avoid my gaze. You're worried about him? Yes. Esmeralda drew her knees to her chest. Heart's like a brother to me. He was my twin sister's mate. A memory tickled the back of my mind. Ashling was a druidess, but she wanted to be a warden. She tilted her head and studied me. How did you know that? I tapped my fingers to my lips and struggled to remember what he'd said about her. Hart told me how she died. I guess I assumed she was a warden, too. But when you said twin sister, I thought maybe she was more like you. The words coming out of my mouth made no sense. I hadn't guessed or assumed. Somehow I'd known Ashling had lost her life because she'd left the sacred groves to hunt with her mate. Esmeralda watched me like a professor waiting for the correct answer. My lips tingled, a tingle that intensified into burning. Without thinking, I licked them, and my tongue erupted in pain. You touched your mouth after cutting the plant. The druidess continued to study me. But it's only poisonous if ingested. 
I sounded as if I'd been hit with a massive dose of lidocaine. This isn't typical mistletoe. It's extremely toxic. Toxic? I struggled to reconcile the word and her apparent lack of concern. Perhaps she's testing me. I couldn't have had enough on my fingertips to cause a fatal reaction. Or so I thought until my throat began to swell. Do something. She waited as if expecting something. Hafios. Agadjaya Nithu. The liniment that hurts the most is the best medicine. I had no idea how I knew what she'd said. Or if I'd understood her at all, mistletoe could cause hallucinations. One thing I knew for certain, I didn't have much time before my airway closed. Esmeralda repeated the Gaelic phrase. Memories that couldn't belong to me flashed in and out of my mind. Shifters with swollen faces. Others with rotting wounds. Hard unconscious on the beach. His injured shoulder. Dumping my basket, I searched through the wax paper pouches until I found one containing pale blue flowers that reminded me of primroses. I crushed the blooms in my hand, added the bruised petals, and drank. The druidess clapped her hands. Very good. You remembered. Unimpressed, I dipped the hem of my skirt into the remaining liquid and pressed it to my mouth. Not only had my throat opened, but my lips and tongue had stopped stinging. I don't recall you teaching me how to counteract poison, but I remember doing it several times. How is that possible? Don't be cross with me and don't mention the memories to heart until the right moment. If you tell him too soon, you'll lose him. Soon, you will both come to understand everything. She took my hands in hers and pressed a kiss to my cheek. I promise. Toxic. I struggled to reconcile the word and her apparent lack of concern. Perhaps she's testing me. I couldn't have had enough on my fingertips to cause a fatal reaction. Or so I thought until my throat began to swell. Do something. Hafios. Agadjaya Nithu. The liniment that hurts the most is the best medicine. I had no idea how I knew what she'd said, or if I'd understood her at all. Mistletoe could cause hallucinations. One thing I knew for certain, I didn't have much time before my airway closed. Ha fios, agad jay anithu, Esmerald repeated the Gaelic phrase. Memories that couldn't belong to me flashed in and out of my mind. Shifters with swollen faces, others with rotting wounds, hard unconscious on the beach, his injured shoulder. Dumping my basket, I searched through the wax paper pouches until I found one containing pale blue flowers that reminded me of primroses. I crushed the blooms in my hand, added the bruised petals, and drank. The druidess clapped her hands. Very good. You remembered. Unimpressed, I dipped the hem of my skirt into the remaining liquid and pressed it to my mouth. Not only had my throat opened, but my lips and tongue had stopped stinging. I don't recall you teaching me how to counteract poison, but I remember doing it several times. How is that possible? Magic is a wonderful and fickle thing. I understand, but how could you just stand there and wait for me to remember or die? Don't be cross with me and don't mention the memories to heart until the right moment. If you tell him too soon, you'll lose him. Soon, you will both come to understand everything. She took my hands in hers and pressed a kiss to my cheek. I promise. No. Tell me now. I don't understand. I felt Hart's energy before he appeared. But I'd learned to accept weird and downright bizarre occurrences in my time with Esmeralda. After all, I'd almost gone into anaphylactic shock, while an honest-to-goodness druidess mumbled Gaelic proverbs. Hart knelt a few feet from us. Esmeralda. She stood and motioned to me. Warden of Clan Birch. You will greet my acolyte with the same respect you show me. Wide-eyed, he gaped at me, then the druidess, and back to me. Eilish. I had no idea if I should stand to acknowledge him, or if a nod would do. I'd spent my time exploring the island and discussing plants. The subject of druid protocols hadn't come up, neither had anything about acolytes, but I liked the sound of it. You may rise. Warden. Esmeralda winked at me. I've come to take Eilish to my home, as you asked. He didn't have dark circles under his eyes or slumped shoulders or a flat voice, but I knew he hadn't gotten much sleep. I could feel his exhaustion in my bones. Esmeralda stood a foot shorter than the dragon shifter, but she seemed to take up more than her fair share of physical space, likely because she held herself with the grace of a queen. Very well. The other wardens will take your patrols. 
she is your priority. If any harm comes to her, I will hold you responsible. I cringed, I bet he's thrilled about that. As if she'd heard my thoughts, the druidess winked at me again. I busied myself with placing the pouches back into my basket. I will protect her with my life. Hart bowed his head. Let's see that it doesn't come to that. Warden. She offered her hand and helped me to my feet. I'll send for you again soon. I'm looking forward to it. While I didn't appreciate the near-death experience, I hated to leave her. Esmeralda pulled me into an embrace, something she hadn't done before. She eased back and met my gaze. I'll miss you until then. Eilish. I took a step back. I'll miss you, too. Esme. Hart drew an audible breath. He'd gone slack-jawed, and the color had drained from his face. Are you alright? I reached for him, but he recoiled. Great. Never better. He cleared his throat. It's a long walk back. We should get going. I had a fairly good idea of the distance between the apple orchard and his house. My feet ached thinking about it. Why don't we fly? He folded his arms. It's best if others don't see us in such a compromising position. Esmeralda smacked his shoulder. Nonsense. It will be dark by the time you get home on foot. He turned to face her, which put his back to me. You've charged me with protecting her. There are some who would see her harmed or shame because of her race. And they will not see you forcing the poor woman to walk miles like a pack animal. She scoffed. I will not have it. Fly her home. I will bring the matter of racism to the other druids. It is a cancer that must be stopped. As you wish. Hart wore the same disgusted expression he'd given me on the plane. Let's go. I had no idea what I'd done to piss him off this time, but I'd gotten some of my confidence back in my time with Esmeralda. What I wish is that you'd stop looking at me like I'm something stuck to the bottom of your shoe. Chapter 17 Heart The flight when I'd first met Eilish had held the top position for most awkward journeys of my life, but this trip bumped that one to number two. She hadn't spoken to me since I'd shifted, not a word. In fact, she'd done a damned good job at masking her emotions and stilling her mind. Esmeralda had taught her well. Too well. Eilish had changed in the previous two weeks. And I didn't like it. Her friendship with the druidess needled at me. Not that I minded her developing relationships with other people. Hell. I encouraged it because it'd make her life here more fulfilling. However. Their parting was eerily similar to Esmeralda wishing her sister goodbye. I couldn't take it anymore. I had to know. Why did you call her Esme? It's a nickname. Her clip tone stung like a barb in my underbelly. Why do you care what I call her? She shifted her weight between my shoulders. I don't. I quieted for a few minutes. And asked. Did she tell you to call her that? Eilish laughed. A humorless noise that sounded like a note played on an out-of-tune piano. The only person who has ever called her that was Ashling. Her twin. I drew a breath and braced myself for her response. She stilled. I didn't know. I called her Esme once. And she seemed pleased. I worked hard to keep my voice soft. Friendly even. Esmeralda took Ashling's death very hard. I'm concerned she's using you to fill the hole inside her. This may come as a shock to you, but not everyone is made of iron like you are. There's nothing wrong with needing a friend to help heal one's grief. Sounds like you're speaking from personal experience. All I'm saying is... I can't decide if you're jealous or trying to control me or both. Either way, mind your own business. This is my business. No. Heart, you don't get to have it both ways. You made it clear you don't want me, and I don't need a daddy, so butt out. This woman would be the death of me. I wanted to shake her until she came to her senses or throw her over my knee and spank her until her arse turned a nice shade of magenta. Or push her against the wall and make her scream my name. Damn it. I'd done it again. I'd slipped and fallen into the gutter rather than manning up and admitting I had feelings for her. Feelings that would lead to nothing but heartbreak and disappointment on both our sides. I'd spent the previous two weeks talking myself in circles. I thought I'd found a solution to the problem. But all of that had gone to shit. I sucked in a breath, held it in my gullet, and released it in a torrent of fire. Eilish screamed and clutched my horns. It's best if we don't speak until I shift. Feeling like a complete asshole. I stretched my wings and rode the air current toward the cliffs. You know what? You're a jerk. I thought it when we first met, and I know it now. It's best we don't speak again. Period. Either her shock or anger had broken down the walls she'd constructed. Her emotions poured through our bond. Jerk's too good for me. 
I'm an arse. I'm sorry. I frightened you. I meant it. I'd assumed she was scared. Angry. Maybe sad to leave Esmeralda. But I hadn't expected her to still have feelings for me. Unless I'd misinterpreted the reasons for her mental state. Eilish and I were together in our suffering. She stayed true to her word for the rest of the trip home. While I shifted. And during the walk into the kitchen. She took one look inside. Stopped. And turned on her heel. What's that? I tilted my head as if I had no idea what she referred to. Why is there a compound light microscope on the kitchen table? She pointed at the shiny new gadget. I'd taken advantage of her absence to work on a peace offering. Ian was right. She'd miss me when I left. So I'd come up with a way to keep her happy and distracted. I have a surprise for you. She set her basket on the floor and moved to the machine as if drawn by an imaginary force. These cost thousands of dollars. Heart, I can't accept this. Then you'll hate what I did to my study. Watching her fondle the knobs made me happier than it should have. And no. My mind hadn't drifted to fantasies of Eilish wearing nothing but a lab coat and silk stockings. She pushed past me and speed walked down the hall. This time when she screamed. It sounded less like a banshee and more like a teenage girl. Oh my god. I rested my shoulder against a door jam while she flitted around the room I'd paid a small fortune to convert into a laboratory. I'm no scientist. I'm sure I forgot things. Make a list and I'll see that you have whatever else you need. You did this for me. Her words came out in a rushed, breathy, whisper. I saw how you reacted to the dandelion in the birch grove. I thought you might want some equipment for research or whatever. Trying to play it cool. I shrugged. I'd never admit to her how I'd struggled to understand science ease enough to figure out the necessary contents of a botany lab. I'd never felt like such a moron. But I'd wanted to do it myself instead of sloughing it off on my assistant. Eilish launched herself at me. All four limbs wrapped around my body. She clung to me like a vine and covered my face with kisses. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's amazing. I'll call and see if the ferry company has my laptop, and I'll be back in business. I must have tensed. Or she must have felt my apprehension because she released me. Her face fell. I can't call anyone, and there's no internet here. No. I'm sorry, love. I called about your luggage. But your things were sent home to your parents. Of course, because they think I drowned. Her voice cracked, and my heart broke. I wish things could be different for you. She nodded but avoided my gaze. The lab is lovely, thank you. I, um, I think I'll go clean up before dinner. I brushed her hair back from her face. I'll pick up a laptop next time I go to the mainland. We'll figure this out. Eilish. I know we will. She forced a smile. But right now, I want to soak in that huge tub in the guest bedroom. Her bedroom? I wanted her to settle into my space. To soak in my tub. To sleep in my bed. But Ian was right. I was selfish. I scratched my cheeks. The places where she kissed me had started to tingle. Eilish frowned. Hey, you might want to wash your face. I poisoned myself with Tasmanian mistletoe earlier. It's unlikely. But I might have still had some on my lips. The kind with the purple berries. My heart rate quickened to an adagiato. Yep. My lips swelled. And I started to go into anaphylactic shock. She made a face I couldn't quite interpret. I know jack about plants. But every kid on the island knows to stay away from those purple berries. They're deadly. Even to shifters. We call it death weed. Isn't that the same thing the hunters used? She pressed her hand to her belly and took a step back as if to steady herself. Yes. And it's a good thing Esmeralda was there to help you. I wanted to find the druidess and have a little chat. She should have warned Eilish. Or kept a better eye on her. She dipped her chin. Esmeralda didn't help me. I barely heard her over the rush of blood behind my eardrums. What? Eilish wrapped her arms around herself the way she did when she was upset or frightened. She said something about the worst tasting medicine heals the best, and watched while my throat closed. But she'd taught you what to do to counter the poison. She shook her head and looked away. How did you know what to do? Your education and research? No. Eilish hung her head. I pulled her to my chest. To hell with playing it safe and not getting hurt or not hurting her or whatever other bullshit excuse I had to keep her at a distance you could have died. She melted against me. She wouldn't have let me die. It was a bizarre test or something. I must have passed because I'm still breathing. And she told you I was her acolyte. I don't like it. I buried my face in her hair. Nothing she described made sense. But I intended to get to the bottom of it, Drutus or not. Emerald had no right to put Eilish's life in danger. 
Chapter 18 Eilish Most little girls dreamed of a handsome prince riding to their rescue, but not me. I'd always dreamed of saving myself. I hated the idea of needing a man to make things better, but standing in heart's arms, I couldn't deny it felt good to have someone looking out for me. Unfortunately, my savior would likely be the one who hurt me the most. I turned my face up toward his and met his eyes. I should go upstairs. He leaned in but appeared to think the better of it. And I should wash your poisonous kisses off my face. Good idea. I hated to keep things from him. But Esmeralda had asked me not to tell him about the strange memories. Thankfully, he'd made assumptions about how I'd acquired the knowledge. Wrong assumptions. But I hadn't corrected him. I'll cook dinner after my bath. It's time I started to earn my keep around here. I ducked beneath his arm and headed for the stairs. We'll do it together. You've had enough potentially deadly substances today. Hart followed close behind. Where are you going? My traitorous heart hoped he planned to join me. He pressed his hand to his chest and gave me an innocent grin. Or tried to. He looked more like a dragon in sheep's clothing than a choir boy. In my room to wash my face. I reached the hall at the top of the stairs and hesitated. Let me know if you experience any other symptoms. I have more of the antidote. Will do. Hart stared through half-lidded eyes. He'd worn the same sexy rock star expression in countless photographs, but I couldn't shake the feeling I'd witnessed it while naked in his arms. The hell with it. He closed the distance between us and slanted his mouth over mine. The kiss started like any other kiss, lips on lips, but it evolved into tongue and teeth and hands, everything from the way his hips rolled against mine, to his hard length, to his fingers in my hair, to the sounds he made told me what it would be like to have sex with this beautiful man. He pulled back enough to nuzzle into my neck. Let me make you forget everything for an hour or two. His words and his warm breath left me speechless and wanting. We'd come so close before, but this time, I wouldn't stop him. I knew what to expect from our connection, or thought I did. Please. Hart scooped me up, carried me to his room, and deposited me on his bed. Strip and get in bed while I wash my face. In any other circumstance, I would have argued. Really, I would have. I didn't appreciate men who behaved like they belonged in the Stone Ages. However, the guy who played leading man in my fantasies promised to go down on me. I could set aside equal rights for a few minutes. I made quick work of my clothes and slid between sheets so soft they made silk feel like sandpaper. Hart returned wearing a pair of black boxer briefs and a grin. The girl. I narrowed my eyes. Don't make me regret coming in here. You prefer to be in charge? Maybe I do. In all honesty, I had no idea what I preferred. My experience amounted to a string of forgettable encounters that left me wondering why I'd bothered working up a sweat when I had a battery-operated boyfriend and my imagination waiting for me at home. He handed me a cloth and a cup. It's a natural mouthwash. Dip the rag and coat your lips. It'll remove battery acid. I'm sure it'll take care of death weed residue. Once again I did as I was told. The eucalyptus, mint, and citrus concoction made my mouth tingle. I think you're right. This stuff is amazing. He set the cloth and cup on the nightstand and stretched out beside me. I waited for what felt like an eternity for him to say or do something other than stare into my eyes. I might not have had a ton of sex in my life, but I knew nothing would happen with me below the covers and him above them. What's he waiting for? Has he changed his mind? What happened to the guy in the hall? I should go. Eilish, do you plan to make a move or are you going to talk yourself out of this? He bit his lip as if trying not to laugh. My brain screeched to a halt. Me, you're waiting for me. You didn't take kindly to me ordering you about. His voice deepened, which made his accent more pronounced. I wanted to laugh or smack him or climb on top of him, but I couldn't bring myself to do anything. Get under the blankets. Hart did as I asked and only as I asked. The big jerk seemed to enjoy his little game of make Eilish suffer. Now what? Determined to wipe the smirk from his face, I gathered up every ounce of courage in me, came to my knees, and straddled him. Not his hips, or his abdomen, his face. He made a sound somewhere between a gasp and a moan, and ran his hands over my backside. This, I could get used to. The first swipe of his tongue made me regret my choice of positions. My thighs trembled to the point. I worried I'd collapse and smother him. Hart, on the other hand, didn't seem concerned. He kissed and licked and teased until I moaned in frustration. What's the matter, love? He punctuated the question with a nibble on my inner thigh. 
I reached down, curled my fingers in his hair, and rolled my hips forward until I had his mouth exactly where I wanted it. He took the hint, digging his fingers into my thighs, he did something fantastic with his tongue. There, right there, I closed my eyes and rocked back and forth until I felt the pressure building inside me. Every movement, thought, and intention zeroed in on reaching my goal, but still, it evaded me. For several heartbreaking moments, I wondered if it would happen. And then it did. White-hot pleasure consumed me. I barely recognized my body. It seemed to have disconnected from my brain and moved on pure instinct. Sounds came from my lips that I was sure I'd never made before. Primal, urgent, and demanding. Heart shifted his weight beneath me. The next thing I knew I was flat on my back with his body pinning me to the mattress. His eyes had gone from human to dragon silver. Let me mark you as my mate. You'll have your life back. Your freedom. All of it. He trembled, giving me an idea of how hard he fought the urge to sink inside my body. My heart lurched. I wanted it. I wanted him. But I couldn't imagine how it would work. You're willing to go with me to Atlanta. He ran his fingertips down my cheek. No. Love. It'd be a means to an end. But not an easy one. I pushed his shoulder to get him off me. I don't understand. Heart groaned, rolled to his side, and tugged me close. As my mate. You would be allowed to leave Eileen Dreit. But, I closed my eyes and breathed in his scent. How could someone feel so right and still be so damn wrong? But it would be difficult on both of us to be apart. He caressed my back in lazy circles. I had a feeling I knew where this would lead. But I wanted to hear him say it. Why would we have to be apart? Your life is in Atlanta. He eased back and met my gaze. Eilish, I'm sorry. But I've already lost one mate. I cannot lose another. Why? I hadn't stopped to consider the implications of the differences between us. Because I'll grow old. Yes. Please. Let me give you your life back. The desperation in his voice made my breath hitch. I wanted to say yes. But it seemed wrong somehow. You're suggesting something like a marriage of convenience. Yes. He sighed as if relieved I'd finally come to my senses. The longing for each other would be hard. But it'd fade in time. Fate enough for me to fall in love with someone else. The part of me who suddenly understood Gaelic, and which flowers could cure death weed poisoning, knew the answer. I'd have the freedom to return to my life, but my heart would remain enslaved to him. No. He tucked my hair behind my ear. It would be the same for me. We could agree to meet a couple times a year to sate our physical needs. But it would only make our parting that much more difficult. I forced a smile and pulled away. Thank you for the offer. It means a lot you're willing to sacrifice so much for me. But my answer is no. Heart sat up. It's only sex. Eilish. I'm willing to go without if it means you'll be happy. I slid my hand-me-down blouse over my head and grabbed my skirt. That's just it. Heart. I wouldn't be content knowing I'd never have the chance to fall in love, get married, and have babies. I'd rather work hard and earn my freedom than to live a lie. He furrowed his brow. But it's not a lie. We would be mates. Do you love me? He turned his head. What little hope I had left inside me died. I would have fought heaven and earth to find a way to be with this man. But I couldn't make him love me. I understood how Chevon must have felt when she'd come for dinner and found me in the kitchen. Only I had no one to blame. Clinging to my last shreds of dignity, I managed to keep my voice even. I want more than a supernatural bond. I deserve a man who will love me. I'm sorry. Don't be. I kissed his cheek and tugged on his hand. You've never led me to believe you cared more than you do. I'm happy to call you my friend. With benefits. He flashed me his famous grin. Though I'd come to understand it was his way of masking his true self from the world. Sure. But you have droves of women who can give you benefits. I wanted to curl up and cry but refused to put him on an emotional guilt trip. Instead, I pulled him toward me. Come downstairs. I'm starving. All right. All right. He tugged his jeans over his hips. I'll be down in a minute. I nodded and walked to the hall, thankful to have a few moments to myself. Turning him down had been one of the hardest things I'd ever done. But I'd meant what I'd said. I refused to be tied to someone who didn't love me. Ten minutes later, Hart joined me in the kitchen. I pretended not to notice his watery eyes, and he pretended not to notice mine. He peeked over my shoulder at the vegetables I'd chopped for a stir-fry. That looks good. But where's the meat? He poked my side. I jumped and swatted his hand away. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, no tickling. It's vegetarian. In case you missed it in biology class. Dragons are carnivores. He poked me again. 
I giggled despite myself and my bruised heart. Omnivores. And they don't teach dragon anatomy and physiology and bio 101. The back door opened and a female called out. Hello? Anyone home? Hart cursed under his breath. We're in the kitchen. Chevon. But you knew that already, didn't you? She rounded the corner and shrugged. You look like shite. Cutting onions are you? I opened my mouth to speak, but he stepped in front of me. Something like that. What brings you all the way out here this time of night? I've come to babysit your human. Keeping himself between me and the female, he said. There's no need. I'm not on patrol duty. My heart sank. Not only had he allowed her to insult me, he'd all but agreed with her. Chevon's smile reminded me of the old idiom, a fox in a hen house. She knew something we didn't. She dipped her chin and glanced away. You haven't heard then? His shoulders tensed. Heard what? When she looked up, she had tears in her eyes. Adorn and Paydar were killed on patrol last night. Hart tilted his head toward the ceiling and ran his hand over his jaw. Where? Just off the western coast. Some of the young ones heard the fight. The bodies washed up with the tide. Their wounds had rotted. It's like you said, they're using death weed. She motioned to me. I'll keep watch over Eilish. You're needed on patrol. He hung his head. They're too close and getting smarter with their attacks. Chevon narrowed her eyes, but smoothed her expression when Hart glanced at her. Some folks are saying it's your human that led them here. But I don't believe it. I'll stay with her until dawn. Make sure no harm comes to her. He turned to me and lowered his voice. I have to go. Promise you'll stay inside until I return. I trusted her as much as I trusted a coiled rattlesnake. But what choice did I have? The hunters had killed two shifters and had nearly killed us. His people needed him far more than I did. Don't worry about me. I'll be fine here with Chevon. Hart gave me a dubious look, pressed his lips to my brow, and turned to the fox shifter. Anything happens to her, and you'll answer to me. She'll be safe. Chevon tilted her head and exposed her neck. He touched her shoulder on the way out the door. A few moments later, a dragon's roar shook the windows and wings beat overhead. I turned to the sink to hide my face from the other woman. It made no sense, but I missed him already. Not like a casual see you soon kind of feeling. The longing inside me seemed to originate in my soul. How would I survive his leaving for a year? Better question. How could he think we could become bonded mates and live apart? Chevon slammed a jacket on the counter beside me. Put this on. There's someone you should meet. Chapter 19. Heart. I'd patrolled the same stretch of coastline, at the same time of year, with the same men, for almost three centuries. But everything was different. Clan Birch had lost two wardens. Something that hadn't happened since the night Ashling died. The hunters had not only found, and apparently surrounded, Eileen Dreit. They'd exploited our weakness of death weed. Tonight of all nights I needed to have my wits about me. But my mind drifted to the little brunette in my kitchen. She told me to go. But a blind man could have seen the fear in her eyes. And there was Chevon to consider. She might have pasted on a pretty smile. But she was trouble. The last time I'd returned home. She'd made her intentions clear. The fox wanted me and wouldn't take no for an answer. I'd barely escaped with my life. Let alone my virtue. Ian flew a hundred feet to my left and rear in order to ride in my draft and conserve energy. Speaking through our bond, he said. Dude. You're kicking off massive amounts of heat. What's on your mind? What do you make of Chevon? She hates humans. But she's made it abundantly clear she wants to join us on tour. Ian snorted. She's desperate to leave here. She's as racist as the leprechaun. But rumor has it she's been sneaking away to Dublin to meet someone. My mouth went dry. Is she desperate enough to give the hunters death weed? No way. The girl's been in love with you since she was in pigtails. She wouldn't risk them using it on you. Or me for that matter. I shouldn't have left Eilish alone with her. I'd sit the fox down for a long chat. I had no intention of dating her. But I valued our friendship enough to call her out on her bullshit. I wouldn't tolerate her prejudices against humans regardless of how things turned out between me and Eilish. I'm surprised to see you here. I thought Esmeralda ordered you to protect her new protégé. You know the one? 
The woman you refuse to claim. It's none of your business, but I'm handling it. I scanned the water on the far side of the barrier. They were out there somewhere, waiting for a chance to kill more wardens. You're going to claim her. I tried, but she turned me down. I veered to the left and headed toward the harbor where I'd last seen the hunters. The area was outside our designated patrol. But we'd covered the same ground for hours and found nothing. Oh. Shit. Sorry bro. He spoke as if I'd told him I'd lost my guitar hand. But hey. Condolences and all. There are no condolences. I'm going back on tour as planned. End of story. Movement on the other side of the barrier caught my eye. Look what we have here. Hunters. Ian growled. Let's roast them. I'm starving. A smaller boat, on our side of the magical wall, sped toward the larger vessel. Who is that and what the hell are they doing? It's one of ours. I don't know but they are too close to the barrier. Keep your distance. It could be a trap. I flew over the sea to get a better look at the boat. Son of a bitch. Ian followed but gasped and opened his wings to stop his forward momentum. Tell me that's not your would-be mate down there. I didn't trust myself to respond. The entire mate situation had become a moot point. Eilish had not only shot me down. It appeared she'd made a break for it as soon as I'd left the house. What did she do with Siobhan? Are you kidding? The fox probably handed her a flashlight and kissed her goodbye. The larger boat inched closer to the barrier protecting the island. Until then. I believed the magic had obscured the island from view to all except the wardens. But now I wasn't sure. They certainly appeared to have spotted Eilish. How do you want to handle this? Ian continued to stare at the situation unfolding below. What is she doing? I don't know. I racked my brain for an alternative explanation but came up empty. Eilish wasn't an innocent bystander pulled into a situation she had no control over. She was a hunter all along. I hadn't realized how much I loved her until that moment. My wounded pride made me want to fly past the barrier and incinerate both vessels. But I couldn't harm her. I could, however, snatch her from the boat and not stop flying until I reached Atlanta. I could understand her cozying up to me. But how could she have pretended to befriend Esmeralda? The druidess would be heartbroken when she learned of the betrayal. Ian flew closer to my side. Make the call. Heart. Let her go. I'm curious to see how this plays out. My dragon struggled for control but I held him at bay. The beast knew only that she was in danger. It understood nothing of motives or betrayal or bone-wrenching disappointment. And if this is a freakish coincidence? The input distance between us. Though I could feel the tension rolling off his massive body. I don't believe in coincidences. I braced myself for what would happen next. I felt as if I were watching an oncoming collision. I couldn't turn away. I needed to see the carnage before I would be free of her. Eile should reach the barrier. But the hunter's boat had turned in the opposite direction. My chest tightened. Had I made a mistake in assuming the worst? I focused on her energy through the beginnings of our bond and felt only fear and confusion. I'd expected determination. Or perhaps emptiness. But Eilish was terrified. Something's off. I don't think this was a rendezvous. No shit. The inn swatted me with his barbed tail. Seriously. Dude. I heard Esmeralda made her an acolyte. Do you think the druidess would miss the fact she's a hunter? He had a point. Esmeralda had a gift for scrying. The druidess could see the future clearer than most could see the present. You could have said something sooner. And risk you turning all that pent-up aggression on me. I couldn't argue. The entire to mate or not to mate situation had compromised my ability to lead. Whatever happened or didn't happen between me and Eilish. I had to get a handle on my emotions before I got someone killed. We have to get to Eilish before they spot her. I'll follow your lead. The encircled overhead. Go under the water on this side of the veil. Cover me. I'll shift when I'm close to her. Without waiting for his response. I stretched to my full length and caught a downdraft. Hitting the water at full speed. I tucked my wings and torpedoed toward Eilish. Rapid. High-pitched squeals. Like a supersonic jackhammer. Battered against my eardrums. It took a millisecond for me to register the noise. And another to realize we were in serious trouble. Behind me, Ian called out. Shift. They are using sonar. I couldn't change forms. Not yet. I hadn't reached my mate. Get Eilish. I'll distract them. You're closer. Ian breached the surface before I could argue. I reached the tiny craft, shifted to human form, and came up for air. Waves pushed me this way and that. But I managed to grab the rope on the side of the boat. Eilish, 
Jump. The motor died. There's a larger vessel at my five o'clock. She shouted over the roar of the water. At some point, the female must have realized the seriousness of her situation. Because she'd woven the straps of a donut-shaped life preserver around her upper arms. Hunters. A larger wave crested over the side of the boat and dragged me under. If not for the mooring line, it would have pulled me out to sea. I surfaced coughing and gasping for breath. We can't make it back to shore from here. She glanced around as if trying to figure out how she'd gotten there. Ian's dragon roared overhead, followed by the whoosh of a harpoon gun. A torrent of fire lit the night. Enough for me to gauge the distance between us and the other vessel. Too damned close. Ian's going to get himself killed. You've got to trust me. Jump. She clutched the flotation device closer to her chest. It's too cold. You have to trust me. I'd given her little to no reason to do so. Everything I'd done for her had been to suit my needs. Not hers. Hell. I'd refuse to answer when she'd asked if I loved her. Baby. Please. Jump. I'll keep you safe. I swear. She tore her eyes from the sky. Turned. And leaped into the water. Swim. I'm right behind you. I dove beneath the water until my lungs screamed for want of air. And pushed further. White spots danced in the corners of my eyes. And still. I swam. I couldn't shift with her nearby without risking impaling her on a spike. But the icy water would kill her if I didn't hurry. I released control and let the dragon take over. He broke free and headed straight for Eilish. While the human part of me struggled to gain its bearings. The dragon had no such problem. He jerked his mate to his chest and took to the sky. Got her. Ian called from the far side of the hunter's boat. Yes. Get out of there. The sounds of gunfire filled the night air. I turned in time to see Ian's body jolt from the impacts. I changed course and flew a wide circle around the boat. How bad are you hit? I'll live. But I need to bail soon. Take Eilish. I'll deal with them. I met him on the far side of the harbor. Blood marred the softer scales on his belly. But none of the wounds appeared life-threatening. Were the bullets poisoned? Don't think so. But they got my wing. They eased her into his claws and cradled her to his chest like a hatchling. Be careful. Will do. Now go. I opened my wings and flew toward the heavens before I changed my mind. Placing her in the care of another male went against my every instinct. But I wouldn't retreat until I'd eliminated the threat. I blew through a cloud bank and hovered. Without cover. I would have eclipsed the stars and given away my location. Aerial attacks were risky. Normally. I would have hit the boat from below. But their sonar had forced my hand. I waited until the boat passed directly below me. Unleashed a column of fire and darted to the next clump of clouds. The men below managed to get off several rounds. Luckily, I had science on my side. Blue flames in an otherwise dark sky made it difficult to see. And one needed to see to hit a moving target, or so I hoped. Screams replaced gunshots. But I held my position. The acrid stench of burning man-made material stung my nostrils. And still. I waited. One of two things would happen. Either the hunters would make a break for it on the escape raft attached to the side of the vessel, or the fuel tanks would blow. The explosion lit the night sky like a miniature sun. Chapter 20. Eilish. Whoever said reptiles were cold-blooded had never met a dragon. I stood in an enormous shower, but the seven jets of hot water couldn't compare to the warmth of the man's skin. Be it his nature or some trick of magic, he radiated a heat that permeated my flesh and settled into my bones. I'd promised myself I would put some boundaries between us, but standing there, silent in heart's arms, all I felt was peace. And then he ruined it. What were you thinking? He practically growled and snatched a shampoo bottle from the recessed shelf. I don't know, but I never would have gotten into that tiny boat of my own free will. Suddenly very aware of my bare breasts, I folded my arms. What do you mean? You don't know? He turned me around and eased my head beneath a stream of water. I remember following Chev on outside. She said something about a meeting. I struggled to recall her exact words, but the memories rested out of my reach. I grasped onto the only thing I could trust, my anger. It kept me upright and sane in a situation that was anything but. Everything's fuzzy. I don't remember leaving the grounds. It's all right. You're safe now. Hart worked the shampoo into my hair with a tenderness that threatened to break me into a million pieces. I doubted anywhere on Eileen Dryect was safe for me, but his fingers massaging my scalp made me want to believe him. What did she do to me? Why can't I remember? He angled my head to rinse the shampoo. Chavon doesn't have the kind of abilities you're describing. 
she must have had an accomplice. Someone with the power to mesmerize humans. Mesmerize. I eased away and wrapped my arms around myself. You're saying someone hypnotized me. Hart squirted a dollop of conditioner into his hands and motioned for me to turn. It's not like in the movies. You aren't going to cluck like a chicken every time someone snaps their fingers. Mesmer is a type of spell. Most of the time it's used as a precautionary means to confuse a human into forgetting what they've seen. After everything I'd experienced, creatures doing spells on humans shouldn't have surprised me. But it did. I closed my eyes and tried to focus on the feel of his fingers running through my hair. Nothing about me getting into a tiny boat and motoring into the North Sea made sense. I'd studied the weather and the currents before my trip. I knew the conditions this time of year varied from moderately choppy to waves that could capsize an ocean liner, and that the sea could change with little or no warning. Mesmerize. Make humans forget. I spun around and grabbed his arms. Why can't we find someone to mesmerize me into forgetting this place? The fairy. Meeting you. All of it. Hart winced as if I'd struck him. Don't you see? I could go home. You wouldn't be stuck with me. You'd be free. I puzzled over his faraway expression and the creases in the corners of his eyes. If I didn't know better, I'd have thought I'd hurt him. It's not that simple, is it? He shook his head. You've spent too much time here. Mesmer spells only work with small bits of time. Oh. My chest tightened and my eyes burned. I needed to process everything that had happened, and I didn't want him to witness my impending meltdown. Could I have a few minutes alone? In a minute. There's something I need to say to you first. Hart took my face in his hands and forced me to meet his eyes. When I realized you were in danger, I had one regret. None of this was your fault, Chevon. Okay. Two regrets. He swallowed hard. I love you. I should have told you when you asked me. But I was afraid. I stared into his eyes and fought to hold back my tears. Eilish. He ran his thumb over my cheek. This is the part where you're supposed to say something. I choked on the emotion clogging my throat. I love you, too. But it doesn't change anything. He dropped his hands to my shoulders. It changes everything. I'm still human with a much shorter expiration date than you. Hart winced and drew me into an embrace. I don't care. I'd rather spend the next 50 or so years loving you than regretting letting you go. I pulled away and turned my back to him. Please. I need a few minutes to myself to think. He cleared his throat. I'll get out of the shower. But I'm not leaving the bathroom. I watched him go and caught my misty reflection in the mirror. For a split second, I thought I saw the kaleidoscope eyes of a druida staring back at me. I hurried from the shower and cleared the steam from the glass. What's wrong? He turned me to face him. Do my eyes look weird? I opened them wide. Hart shook his head. I turned back to the mirror and couldn't look away. It felt as if a force reached out and pulled my head toward my reflection. Only I no longer saw myself or heart of the bathroom. The reflection had morphed into a small crowd. An angry crowd carrying torches and weapons. I searched the creature's faces. Two humanoid and three animal. Eilish. You're freaking me out. He rested his hand on my shoulder. And the scene in the mirror broadened. I recognized the heather fields outside the house, and more troubling, I recognized Chevon walking with a man half her height. Do you see that? Hart glanced from me to the mirror, and back. Stars in the heavens. Are you scrying? I'd never heard the term, but I knew its meaning. Just like I'd known which flowers to counteract the poison and recognize the stone on the beach, and knew things about the man beside me I had no right to. What did you see? He turned me to face him and stumbled back. Your eyes. Downstairs, glass shattered, a heartbeat later, an explosion rocked the house. It shouldn't have been possible over the roar of flames. But I heard Shevon and the six others chanting a spell. They hadn't thrown Molotov cocktails, they'd thrown magic. Hart grabbed a robe from the back of the door and wrapped it around my shoulders. Let's go. Struggling to shove my wet arms into the sleeves, I followed him to the glass doors leading to his balcony. No. Wait. They'll see us. He hesitated, but turned and dragged me into the hall. The crow's nest. Another ball of magical fire burst through a window on the lower level of the house. The floor beneath our feet groaned. Flames engulfed the visible parts of the first story, and the second floor began to collapse. The entire structure would fall in on itself before long. Go! I screamed and shoved him toward the stairs leading to the observation deck on the roof. The words of a spell hung on the tip of my tongue. I raised my arms and prepared a counterattack. Hart broke my concentration and tossed me over his shoulder. 
put me down. I can do this. I battered his back, but he refused to budge. My lab, your house. Forget the house. We'll build a new one. He tightened his grip on the way up the winding staircase. When we get to the top, stay away from the railing. I'll shift, then circle back to get you. No. There's no time. Hold me and leap from the side facing the sea. Just make sure you catch me when I fall. My heart pounded and my lungs burned. But I laughed. I had absolute trust in this man. A part of me that I'd forgotten long ago remembered him. Remembered us. Remembered a similar escape. Heart went as still as the grave. Ashling, is it really you? Go. We don't have time to talk. Chapter 21. Heart. The magic burst from me stretching and changing flesh and bone, turning skin to scales, and nails to talons. The dragon roared its way into existence like a wailing newborn. He wanted his mate. The druidess who had perished over two centuries before had returned and was in danger. The beast dove toward the sea, positioned itself beneath the falling woman, and rolled to his back to soften her landing. Eilish hit the dragon's belly, bounced once, and scrambled for something to hold onto. I wrestled control from the dragon and rotated in a half-barrel roll. Eilish grabbed a spike to stop her fall. One steady. She used a hand-over-hand -hand maneuver to grapple the next horn and the next. Until she found her footing between my shoulder blades. Circle back on my command. No freaking way. We're going to the birch grove to find Esmeralda. The druids can dole out justice. I veered to the right hard enough to throw her off balance. She shifted her weight like a surfer riding a wave and remained on her feet. They'll get away. At least let me mark them. I growled. Did you miss the part where they're throwing magic bombs? She stopped her foot. Did you miss the part where I suddenly have Ashling's memories? Plus, you breathe fire. I said no. Heart, I'm serious. Take me back. Or I'll jump. She stepped to the edge of my back. I'd always said she'd be the death of me. Why should realizing that Eilish was the reincarnated soul of my lost mate make a difference? I will when you sit down. She held onto a horn at the base of my neck and went to one knee. I have to be able to visualize the target. Despite my house burning to the ground and an angry crowd of fire-throwing villagers, my heart soared. She might share Ashling's memories. But the woman on my back was the little navy vet, science nerd, who'd pulled me from the sea. I opened my wings and rode the updraft to the top of the cliff. Ready? Eilish's determination combined with Ashling's magic to form one hell of a counter-attack. Jibe ho! As I'd planned. We breached the top of the cliff on the left side of the fire and used the smoke as cover. I counted five people. She unleashed the spell. A split second later. The members of the hate squad ran screaming as if chased by the slaw. We're missing Shavon and a short, squat male. We'll find them. Hang on. I pumped my wings to gain altitude and flew ever widening circles around the ruins of my home. What did you do to them? I created a swarm of heat-seeking wasps. She giggled and ran her hands over the base of my spikes like Ashling used to. They'll be easy to spot in a crowd. Remind me never to get on your bad side. I laughed harder than I had in too long to remember. I think we've lost them. Eilish settled onto my back. I'll take us to the birch grove. Esmeralda will want to see you. Her tension seeped into my muscles and formed a knot in my neck. Tell me what's wrong or you're going to have to massage away a dragon-sized tension headache. I'm not her, you know. I know. Do you? The uncertain tone in her voice pulled at my heartstrings. You use terms like visualize the target, jibe ho, and heat-seeking wasps. Ashling died when military units fought with muskets. The soul holds one's magic. The life you've lived and experiences you've had shape your personality. You're my Eilish. But you carry Ashling's magic. And her memories. I felt her curl into a bowl and pictured her holding her middle as if to keep herself whole. Not all of them. Only the ones related to magic. And you. I wanted nothing more than to hold her. But that would have to wait. Yes. And her memories of me because whether you care to believe it or not, mating isn't a chemical reaction in the brain. It is the purest form of magic. And yet, we've both resisted it. Her despair washed over me like a funeral dirge. Because we're both fools. She laughed and seemed to perk up. Only to sink back into her thoughts. What if Esmeralda is disappointed? She's likely already seen the conversation we are about to have. I caught movement from the corner of my eye and turned my head in time to see Shevon and Owen, the racist leprechaun, waiting in a clearing near the birch grove. There they are. Feel free to blast the leprechaun into oblivion. Eilish gathered her magic. But a fireball the size of a small car slammed into my neck before she could release it. Heart. Pain roaring through my body. 
I jolted to the left hard enough to send Eilish scrambling for a handhold. A dragon could walk through natural flames. However. Owen hadn't lobbed your garden variety bonfire at us. The spell he'd used coated my scales with an oily substance that seeped between and beneath them. I needed to smother it with sand. But I didn't dare fly over the sacred grove for fear of burning the trees. Eilish cast spell after spell. But nothing extinguished the blue flames. You have to get to the sea. Water will make it worse. I have to smother it. Take the leprechaun out before he casts another one. I pooled every ounce of my remaining energy and circled back. Tachta. Eilish's voice rang out through the clearing below. Owen gripped his throat and went to his knees, as if an invisible force had closed his windpipe. Shavon turned and ran. And several druids stepped from the tree line. A bold male I didn't recognize from the distance motioned for me to land. Where's Esmeralda? Do you trust them? Eile sounded frantic. Struggling to stay aloft. I muttered. Call to her. Her energy shifted. But I could no longer feel her intentions or emotions. The fire had made its way into muscle and would soon burn through the major blood vessels in my neck. I had a matter of minutes before the spell would take my head from my body. I did my best to land without injuring Eilish. But we hit the ground hard enough to rattle the buildings in the village. Help him. She scrambled down and hurried into my line of vision. Shevon rushed forward, grabbed Eilish by her hair, and kicked the back of her knee to force her to the ground. You will kneel before them. I will not kneel before my equals. She caught the fox shifter with a jab to her gut and broke free. The bald druid spat on the ground. You are a human who has learned a few tricks. Eilish motioned to the lot of them. And you are nothing more than acolytes on a power trip. She was right. Not a single one of the wannabe druids' eyes swirled with magic. I nudged her side. Find Esmeralda. And never forget I truly love you. Chapter 22 We stood feet from the healing energy of the sacred grove, but it may as well have been miles away. I called to Esmeralda until my head throbbed. On some level, I knew magic, like any other natural resource, would run dry if not replenished. Yet, I continued to reach out to the druidess. Esme, my soul sister, my mate needs you. Find Esmeralda, and never forget I truly love you. Hart's words stopped me cold. The flames had gone out, but the scales along his neck continued to crackle. Several littered the ground around him. Whatever the leprechaun had done to him hadn't ended. I searched my memories for a spell or a plant or anything that could help to stop the damage, and came up short. The female acolyte tilted her head. Who are you then? I am Eilish. I carry the soul of Ashling, sister of Esmeralda, pushing past the heat emanating from his body. I placed my hand on Hart's muzzle and pulsed my remaining energy into him. I had to keep him alive long enough to heal him. She folded her arms. If what you're saying is true. Then it should be nothing for you to prove it to us. I started to motion to the dead leprechaun, but thought the better of it. I doubted they would react well to me admitting I'd killed one of their kind. Chewing her lower lip, Shevon stared at Hart. He's dying. If what you're saying is true, why haven't you healed him? I'd spent enough time arguing. I needed to do something fast. Rather than turning my back on the others, I moved to his other side. The birch trees sang to me. I could almost see their energy pushing against the boundary of the grove. I had to move him, but he had to weigh as much as a T-Rex. Hart, can you hear me? Yes. His voice sounded distant, as if he'd answered from across the field. I ran my hand down his muzzle. I need you to shift. Burning. Gaelic words flashed through my mind like cards spinning on a Rolodex, and settled on Oost. Water? No. He said it would make it worse. I considered the original blue flames and the heat that continued to emanate from his neck. Is it a magic version of an ethanol fire? Alcohol floats on water. Dousing him would make the flames spread. I needed a special class of extinguisher, but doubted I could recreate a chemical compound from thin air. Or could I? I conjured a mental image of the thick foam and drew energy from the ground beneath my bare feet. Tuchk. A column of white goose shot from my palms and curled around Hart's neck. The acolytes spoke amongst themselves, but I'd stopped listening or caring. I remained planted in the dragon sightline. Once the foam stopped the invisible flames, I'd need to get him to the grove. Shevon gasped. Your eyes! I resisted the urge to turn and glare. I never meant for them to hurt him. Her voice rose too high and too loud, as if she verged on hysteria. 
I motioned for her to come closer. He's going to shift soon. When he does, we're going to move him into the grove. I need you to support his neck. Shevon nodded. You're not going to hurt him. Why would I think that? She stared with wide eyes. Hart drew a shaky breath. One moment, my hand rested on his scaly face. The next it hung in midair, in human form. He curled into the fetal position, shimmered into view. As I'd feared, Burns covered his neck and shoulders. Now, I hurried forward and waited, while the fox shifter struggled to find a place to support his cervical vertebrae. Hold him. I can't. You do it. I'll lift him. Shevon cried out. I curled my fingers around his neck and pressed the base of his skull forward with my thumbs. My goal was simple. Keep the gaping wound on the front of his neck from opening. Go. She cradled him in her arms and hurried to the tree line. Place him on his side, slowly. I moved with her until heart rested on the cool, damp earth. Now what? Shevon stood and shifted her weight from one foot to the other. Keep the others away. I opened the robe and pressed my bare chest to his back. What are you doing? Why isn't he healing? Warming him. He's ice cold. I refused to answer her other question. I would not give credence to my deepest fear by speaking it aloud. Send for druids. She motioned to the group of acolytes. They are trained. Let them assist you. I considered a request, her agitation, and her concern for heart. I suspected she didn't want to call for help because she worried for her own hide, but I doubted she would willingly harm my mate. The girl thought she loved him. They can help, but you will go now and find a druid gifted with healing. As you say. She gave me an odd look and dipped into an awkward curtsy. I wrapped my arms around him and hummed the melody to my favorite solstice song, the one Hart had written about Eileen Dryacht. All but the bald acolyte circled around us, and I made a point to meet each of their gazes. Like it had happened with Shevon, I had a sense of their intentions. While they each held varying degrees of fear, none seemed to harbor malicious intent. He needs warmth. The female removed her cloak and covered hard in me, before kneeling at his calves and placing her hands on his feet. I nodded to the female who looked to be about 16 in human years. Can someone make a salve of St. John's word and calendula flowers? I can. Comfrey is good for burns as well. One of the males turned and hurried into the forest. A second boy followed him. The female offered me a shy smile. He will have healed by the time they return. I hoped she spoke the truth. It's good to give them something useful to do. Hart's body temperature remained dangerously low by human standards, and the man normally ran hot. We meant no disrespect. We were not told of your identity. Or of your mating with the warden. I might have Ashling's magic, but it had not come with a guide to druid law. Be that as it may, you pass judgment on me because of my race. Aren't druids humans? Yes. But we have magic. She bowed her head. And humans have science. Is that how you put out the unseen flames? I used my knowledge of science to choose the correct spell. You saved him. She glanced at Hart and sighed the sigh of a young girl looking at a rock star. Rather than saying anything else to chastise or diminish hers and the other's roles in the situation, I fell back on girl talk. He is a pretty one. I... That he is. Her cheeks burn brighter. Marilise. You may go and take the others with you. Esmeralda's voice caused us both to startle. Blessed be. The acolyte bowed and hurried into the grove. I craned my neck to get a look at the druidess. I called for you. She moved to the space Marilise had occupied and seated herself. I know. Why didn't you come? I wondered if I would ever understand Esmeralda. Her every action seemed like a lesson tied in a bow of suffering. She reached forward and brushed Hart's dark hair from his brow. You didn't need me. Like hell I didn't. He suffered needlessly because of you. She raised a brow. Don't give me that look. The druidess held up her hands. It was difficult for me to wait in the shadows. But I foresaw two possible futures. Had I intervened, you both would have perished. The acolytes. I thought back to the moment they'd stepped from the grove. Where's Shevon? She has been detained and will be punished for her betrayal. You mean executed. I shivered. Esmeralda pulled the acolyte's cloak to my chin. I'm afraid so. I will stand for her. Banish her if you must. But she's young. She acted out of jealousy. 
and I saw remorse in her. She lowered her voice. Eilish. Her crime started before you arrived. Shivon is responsible for the deaths of Aiden and Paydar. She gave her human lover. A hunter. Death we'd extract. Hard almost died twice because of her, had it not been for. I thought back to the night I'd fallen off the ferry, the mysterious stranger who healed him. Was you. Esmeralda grinned. I should be thrilled. But I want to punch someone right now. I nuzzled against Hart to ground my anger. As much as I wanted revenge, I hated the thought of more bloodshed. Shevon's greatest wish was to leave Eileen Dryacht. Executing her will give her a new start. Perhaps it's better to bind her to this land. Spoken like a true warrior. I see you. Sister. She laughed and took my hand. I have since the first moment I laid eyes on you. Her words felt like a kick to the kidneys. I'm not Ashling. No you are more. Her spirit has learned and grown in this lifetime. But you are still a warrior masquerading as a healer. I thought about that for a moment. I was a warrior or a sailor, but that wasn't my true calling. I will fight for my patients and those I love, but I am most alive when the plants sing to me. That made her smile. A real smile that softened her otherwise stoic expression. You've never told me you hear their music. I didn't believe it myself until I made room in my brain for magic and science. Esmeralda bit her lip as if trying to hold back laughter. May I join you in warming your mate? I wrinkled my nose. Only if you stay on top of the cloak. Still jealous of my status as the older and more beautiful sister. Older by two minutes, and we are no longer twins. You are by far the fairest of them all. Esme. I'm wise enough to know it's best not to tempt fate until after Hart and I are truly bonded. This time she did laugh, and I join her. Chapter 23. Hart. I'd woken up in some strange places. But I'd never come to in a sacred grove wrapped in the arms of two beautiful drudices. Memories of the night before killed the buzz of the feminine energy surrounding me. The freakinging leprechaun had aimed the fire at my neck. I made my livelihood off my vocal cords. I reached for my throat and forced myself to swallow. It hurt. But not nearly as bad as I'd expected. I wanted to run through my scales to test my range. But I hated to wake the women. Instead. I eased to my other side and faced Eilish. In sleep. She reminded me of a porcelain doll with her pale skin and dark lashes resting on her cheeks. She is lovely. Esmeralda whispered over my shoulder. What is today lucky for, Druidus? I sounded as if I'd gargled with battery acid. Claiming your mate. She moved away from me and cold air replaced her body heat. My voice. Will heal. She stood. Are you so eager to return to the stage? Was I? I searched my soul for the answer and came up wanting. I don't know. Wrong answer. She kicked my arse with her bony foot and stormed away. Didn't anyone ever tell you it's bad luck to piss off a druidess? Eilish muttered and nuzzled into my chest. I wrapped my arms around her and breathed in her scent. How can you smell so good after leaving a burning house and sleeping on the ground? Don't forget riding a burning dragon. I won't anytime soon. I ran my hand from her shoulder to her naked backside. Where are your clothes? You mean the bathrobe? She eased back and met my gaze. It's around here somewhere. I stripped down to keep you warm. My brain skipped a beat. You were ice cold. I thought I'd lost you. Never. I gave her a smile. But I figured she'd see right through it. How do you feel? Grateful and a little sore. She pushed me to my back, rested her head on my shoulder, and draped her arm and thigh over me. Keep doing that and I'm going to feel a different kind of stiff. This? She pressed closer and wiggled her perfect arse. I pushed her to her back and crawled over her body. And what do you think you're doing? She draped her arms over my shoulders. Kissing you. I pressed my mouth to hers. The kiss wasn't as heated as our others. But it held such need that it took everything I had to pull away from her. Heart. We should talk about this. I looked into her eyes. Grinned and kissed a trail down to her breast. But when I tried to dip my head lower. Eilish tugged at my shoulders. I'm serious. What are we doing? It's called for play. I brushed my lips over hers. She sighed and turned her head. I heard what you said to Esmeralda. You should know that I intend to stay here and conduct research. When I'm ready, I will return to Atlanta to share my findings. And there it was. She'd laid it out for me like an ultimatum. But little did she know. I had a counter offer. I'd like to finish my tour. I have five. 
10 years tops before Solstice has to disband. She cocked her head. Why? Ian and I don't age. Unlike Keith Richards. We can't continue to look the same forever. That makes sense. A smile tugged the corners of her lips. You realize my misfortune of being born to human parents is irrelevant, right? I do. Druids don't age as long as they visit the groves a couple of times a year. I nuzzled into her neck. Will you tour the entire ten years? She ran her hands down my back. For the first time, I considered the situation without a hefty dose of wishful thinking. It's more like five years, if I'm being honest. And no. We have time for three albums and three tours. Eilish bit her lower lip. What's going on in that beautiful head of yours? I could come with you. My research can wait a few years. Yeah. My heartbeat in triple time. Unless having me along would cramp your style. Hardly. I traced the seam of her lips with my tongue before delving into her mouth. Eilish kissed me back with the same slow building passion I'd given her. She drew her knees up and wrapped her legs around my waist. I murmured against her mouth. I don't have a condom and it's my lunar cycle. She giggled. Is that something like your period? I bit her lower lip hard enough to elicit a moan. It means we're far more likely to conceive a child. Oh. She shoved my shoulder. Why is it every time we come close to having sex, something gets in the way? You don't want to be a mother. We hadn't discussed it. But I'd always wanted enough children to form a rock band. I do. Very much. But now. My darling. You're a drudus now. I'm sure you can concoct some sort of tear tincture to prevent conception if now doesn't work for you. But I'm cool with bringing a kid on the road with us. The gods won't bless us with new life if it isn't our time. You're beginning to sound too much like Esmeralda. I pressed my hips forward. So it's a go. Roger that. I locked eyes with Eilish and joined our bodies. Each small fraction forward ignited a fire inside me. Until it took every ounce of my willpower to hold back. She gripped me tighter with her thighs. But I held in place and allowed her to rock against me while not giving her another inch. Do you want something? You. I drew her earlobe between my teeth and eased in a little more. I could feel her frustration. But also her growing desire. I had no intention of slamming into her like a hormonal teenager. Heart, please you won't break me. I thrust forward, burying myself inside her to the root. Eilish gasped, digging her nails into my shoulders. She rocked her hips beneath me, but I doubted the position gave her the friction where she needed it. Growling in frustration, she dropped her legs, grabbed my arse, and pushed me where she wanted me. I held myself up on one elbow and turned her face toward mine. Look at me. She opened her eyes and held my gaze as I drew back and pressed forward, over and over. The slow pace accentuated the movement, intensifying the sensation, yet a release remained elusive. Eilish turned her head. I never come like this. I'm not giving up yet. I had a hunch I knew how to get her where she needed to be, lowering my cheek to hers. I sang the lyrics to her favorite song. When she relaxed, I changed the old in-out-in-out in out to grinding circles. She gasped. How did you know? Lucky guess. Her moans grew more urgent and her thighs trembled. She came apart so suddenly that it seemed to take her by surprise. I struggled to hold back, but I wanted to draw out her pleasure. Mark me. Eilish wrapped her legs around my waist as if refusing to let me go and raked her nails down my back, marking me as hers. I tensed until I thought my muscles would cramp and called my dragon to the surface enough to elongate and sharpen my upper canines, exhaling her name upon my release. I buried my face in her breasts and nicked her skin. Eilish moaned her approval. Magic flared between us in a starburst of blue light. The connection we'd shared since we'd first met solidified into a bond so tight it was as tangible as any other part of my body. I brushed my lips across her cheek to her mouth. The kiss felt different, almost reverent. I eased to my side and pulled her along with me. You're amazing. Sorry I took so long. She closed her eyes and snuggled closer. Remember what I told you the first time we met? Never apologize for your passion. I caressed her back. I enjoyed learning how much my voice turns you on. Wrapped warm and safe in my arms, Eilish whispered. I believe my soul recognized you the first time I heard you sing. A melody played through my head, followed by lyrics of love lost and found, of stubbornness, of hope, of Eilish. Chapter 24 Eilish. Six months later, I stared at the stranger in the mirror. She wore skin-tight black jeans and a slinky tank top that revealed entirely too much skin. Nope. I shook my head. Forget it. I'm not going in public like this. 
Sarah finished applying my lipstick and took a step back. You look hot. Heart's going to pass out when he sees you. I'd rather he remain conscious until after the concert. I leaned closer to the mirror and frowned. Seriously, I think this shade of red is illegal south of the Mason-Dixon line. My mother knocked and opened the bedroom door. She took one look at me and sniffled. The car's downstairs. You girls look amazing. She hadn't stopped crying since the media had exploded with stories of mine and Hart's rescue from an uninhabited island in the Shetlands. She'd never forgive me if she knew we'd called the authorities and reported sightings of possible castaways before marooning ourselves on the glorified rock. Mom, don't cry, I promise. Hart and I will come home as often as we can between shows. I pulled her into an embrace. She squeezed me until I thought my ribs would crack. Don't mind me. Sarah joined us in the hug. And if she doesn't, you and I will follow the band around like groupies. My mother snatched a tissue from the counter and blew her nose. Don't think I won't. I didn't get to see my only child walk down the aisle. Hart poked his head into the room and his mouth fell open. Wow. Eilish. Wow. Sorry to interrupt, but we need to get going. One sec. It's not like they're going to start without you. I gave him a playful shove and closed the door. I wasn't going to say anything yet, but... You're pregnant! My mom's hands flew to her mouth. Oh my god. Sarah gripped the counter as if to hold herself upright. I closed my eyes and drew a breath. Between my parents and the tabloids, you'd think we had nothing else going on in our lives besides trying to get knocked up. No, not yet. We've decided to wait a little while. You know, spend some time just the two of us before we settle down and have children. Sarah cracked a grin. Then what's the news? We're buying a house on Tybee Island. Nothing crazy. Just somewhere we can relax in the sun. That's wonderful. But you're both always welcome here. Mom smiled, but I could tell she preferred a grandchild to a daughter with an address in the adjacent zip code. I worried for her if and when the day came that Hard and I would need to remain on Eileen Dryacht. Esmerald and I were working on temporary aging spells. So far, we'd had only minimal success, but the druidess assured me she saw my parents and Sarah long into my future. Hart knocked again. They're killing me, lass. I opened the door and pretended to glare, a wasted effort on a man that could sense my moods better than a Labrador retriever. We're ready. He ran his hand over his stubbly chin. You planning to wear a jacket over that top? Nope. She's a rock star's wife. She needs to look the part or the trolls who follow you on Twitter will rip her to shreds. Sarah hooked her arm in mine and dragged me past him. I glanced over my shoulder and stopped short. Hard and my mother stood with their heads together, whispering. She glanced between us and smiled. I hadn't seen her eyes twinkle like that since before I'd left for Brewery. What are they up to? Hart got us VIP tickets. Dad and I will see you at the arena. She hurried into her bedroom. Hart gave me a bashful smile, the one that revealed the parts of him he reserved only for me. Hart, the roar of the crowd shook the stage beneath my feet. We'd finished our final set, but I had one last song to share with the world and my favorite girl. I took a bow and swapped my electric guitar for the vintage Martin I'd purchased in the 1930s. I stepped to the microphone. I'd like to dedicate the last song of the night to the woman who taught me how to love again. The audience cheered. I motioned to the guys in the control booth. The stage went dark. A moment later. A soft filtered spot illuminated me. What do you say? Would you like to meet Eilish? Some of you might remember her as clueless at 50,000 feet. I glanced to my left and grinned. The love of my life stood in the wings shaking her head. Sarah looked as if she were encouraging Eilish to walk on stage. But she was having no part of it. I turned back to the audience. She's a little shy. Maybe if everyone's real quiet, she'll think you've all gone home. A hush fell over the crowd. But I knew it wouldn't last long. Come on. Love. It's not so bad. They won't bite. I cooed into the microphone. Much. Ian. Bless him. Left his drum kit and strode to the women together with Sarah and my in-laws. He managed to get Eilish to walk out onto the stage. She gave me a look that promised retribution and slid her arm around my waist. Everyone. This is the wee lass that dragged my waterlogged arse out of the North Sea. Not only is she strong. And beautiful. She's the smartest person I know. Even if she did agree to marry me. I pulled her closer to my side and kissed her temple. Eilish. This is everyone. She waved and buried her face in my shoulder. 
the audience erupted in applause. Ian placed a stool beside me and whispered something to her. Eilish went wide-eyed but sad. I turned to her and smiled. I wrote this one that cold night when my throat was on fire. And you nursed me back to health. She smiled and dipped her chin. My nerves threatened to overtake me. Hands shaking. I played the first few notes and leaned into the microphone. Way back when. We danced in fields of heather. Maypole ribbons in the air. You wore yellow flowers in your hair. I still remember the tune we hummed. You held me that night drunk on dandelion wine and whispered softly that you were mine. I still remember the promises we made. A flute joined my acoustic guitar to create an otherworldly feel to the ballad. The truths of ancient whispers in the night's thick wind. I forgive your parting my darling. But this love has no end. I still feel the sting of your tears on my face. I leaned close and ran my thumb over her cheek. Ian added the hollow beats of a bodhran and increased the tempo. The stage lights came up and the crowd cheered. I belted out the course. Lifetimes have passed us like horses on a carousel. You surprised me each time we met. Each time I fell. I remember your smile. Every time as sweet as the last. A certainty mixed with denial. Impossible circumstances. Each time a trial. Eilish fixed her gaze on me and swayed with the music. I remember you called it stubborn. Well I called it determination. I winked. Which earned me a grin. Never forget I love you. We'll be here again. I know the rhythm of your heart song. Beating a melody with my own. Hauntingly familiar. A childhood lullaby calling me home. Lifetimes of searching. Of loving. Of parting. It's our time again. Ian stopped playing and the lights dimmed. I sang the last verse accompanied only by the wafting melody of the flute. Don't despair when winter comes. Spring will give chase to the cold sorrows. We'll spend the summer dreaming of tomorrows. And the autumn growing content. I remember the way my love. We'll be here again. We'll be here again. Eilish watched as if lost in a trance. I had to touch her. I set the guitar aside and drew her into my arms. My voice quivering. I sang the chorus. But this time I sang it to her. Never forget I love you. We'll be here again. This has been Dragonstruck. Written by Catherine M. Hurst. Narrated with AI. If you enjoyed this audiobook, please subscribe to Catherine's channel where you can find more of her paranormal and contemporary romance novels.